You don't want to miss what this guest had to say on Mark Bell's Power Project. The difference is huge in terms of in type 2 diabetics, for example, there was a study done in a group here. The glucose response after lunch when breakfast was consumed was 95% lower than Whoa. when the participants skipped breakfast and had their first meal at lunch. What the fuck? So, <laughs> yeah, right? So, Seriously, that's so, crazy. I've never yeah, heard that before. It was, What's up, Power Project fam? This episode is brought to you by Element Electrolytes. Speaking of Element Electrolytes, I actually wanted to ask you, Ensema, you being all jacked and tan and all strong and pretty, uh, <laughs> do you take your Element Electrolytes pre or post-workout? I actually take it uh, pre, during, and post. Oh. And sometimes I'll do more than one pack. So if I finish the pack of Element that I had during like my workout or my jujitsu session, I'll pop out another one, sometimes post. And that hydration really helps my recovery. Because sometimes after you get done with a really hard workout when you are sweating a lot, you feel sore, you feel kind of tired, and you mm -hmm. feel drained. There is absolutely no problem with taking more than one pack of Element. Yeah, I'm really interested in trying it like uh, intro workout, right? I've always yeah. I've always been one of those guys that's like, oh, you got to have your your pre workout and then your post workout, and in the middle, it's like usually water or something, right? Mm -hmm. But now with Element Electrolytes, from what Rob Wolf told us about how it like maintains strength and all this other just amazing benefits, I'm just I'm really stoked about it and. Uh, if you guys want to be like us, we actually like getting the value bundle because you essentially get a box for free. But if you're not ready to fully commit, Element is still offering you guys a free Element recharge pack. So that's an eight sample pack. All you have to do is cover the shipping. Um, you can do so by heading over to drinklmnt.com slash power project. Again, it's absolutely free. You just have to cover shipping. Make sure you guys go there and check it out right now. What up, Power Project crew? This is Josh Settledge, a.k.a. Settlegate here to introduce you to our next guest, Alan Flanagan. Alan Flanagan has a master's of science in nutritional medicine and is currently pursuing his PhD. His company, Alinea Nutrition, is his online education hub dedicated to empowering others with clear and partial evidence-based knowledge and understanding about the science of nutrition. Alinea is the name of a typographical symbol for a new paragraph representing clarity, structure, and logical thought. These concepts are the foundation of linear nutrition. These core values reject the belief system paradigm within nutrition, the inflexible and dichotomous thinking, and the disempowering effects of polarizing extremes. Within this construct, linear nutrition strives to bring its members a logical and intelligent approach to nutrition science based on the best available evidence. Alan had founded Align Health as an online coaching practice and as a medium to communicate evidence-based nutrition and health science to the general population. From working professionals to professional athletes, Alan provides science-based solutions and protocols to guide motivated individuals to their goals. On top of that, Alan is also a former practicing lawyer from Dublin, Ireland. But that's a different story for another time. Not sure if you guys want to hear about that. So without further ado... Please enjoy this conversation with Alan Flanagan. Now, I can't give you the, the really good gel. Anybody want some of this filtered soul cold brew? Yes. Uh, we're rolling now, mm -hmm. but. Yeah, come get it, buddy. Okay. That's okay. Come Coffee? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I thought mm -hmm. you were maybe yeah. saying something else. Come get it, bro. I was hoping for. Uh, here, this is what I'm going to do. We got some Phil's coffee over here, and uh, we have. Uh, <clears throat> Alan Flanagan on our on our show today, which you just heard from Joss Settlegate, and uh, we're excited to have him on the show because he talks about some things that are a little different than some of our other guests. He talks quite a bit about the timing of your food and and uh, you know having it in the morning or having it at night, and he talks about um, basically these just windows, you know, like having an eating window. I think sometimes having a, a restricted time restricted feeding, as he he calls it, and, and other people are calling it. I think that's almost easier to look at um, that you're going to eat in a certain amount of hours rather than trying to count because it gets to be a little weird when you're trying to count 18 hours and 20 hours. I get confused half the time. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know when that is. Um, but if you do eat around the same times every day, uh, it can work out pretty, pretty well. But I don't know. It's just a really easy thing too for people is probably just to eat like for five hours a day, four hours a day, you know? have a four hour eating window. I'm not saying eat continuously for four hours, but you know, seems reasonable to me. Yeah. And, um, 
I'm going to speak a little louder since the mic isn't on. Dude, what do we got to share? <laughs> that, that's what you get for, uh, for showing up on time today. <laughs> um, no, most definitely. I think uh, if, you know, it, it, it does become easier if you do restrict the time that you eat during the day, just because like naturally you're not going to eat as much in those hours, especially if you're trying to diet. Like mm. it's going to be hard to fit in a crazy amount of calories in five hours. You can do it. Oh, so right. Cool. It's possible. Right. But um, I think especially if you're eating low quality food, really palatable food, you can do it. But if you're eating high quality food, if you do that, it's going to be much easier to diet. But there is a cool post on his page that I saw earlier this morning. Um, he was comparing like the, I guess, I don't know, the, the thermic effect of food of eating breakfast versus dinner. Mm. And apparently breakfast played out a little bit better. So that's what I think, like what you said, in terms of the times of eating during the day, I think he's a guest that has a, or has looked into that a lot more than other individuals. Mm. Because like to me personally, <clears throat> I don't care about that for myself, <clears throat> but this could play into people who are really trying to get a lot extra out of their timing mm -hmm. during the day. And maybe it helps someone better with their sleep because maybe somebody at the moment is eating when it's dark and maybe, I don't know, I guess if you just went back in time, you know, before we had electricity, you know, and it was really dark and all you had was like a fire, uh, it'd probably be really rare to be eating um, later in the day just because it'd be pitch black and you'd be like, it's creepy outside and I hear owls and shit. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go, I'm gonna go to bed or, or whatever. I think, I think you were just not left with a whole lot of options when it was pitch black out. Yeah. You want to be eating at 10 PM. Plus also, I mean, we've, we've had people that have talked to us about eating too close to bed and sleep. So right. How can be good? Resting heart rate and things like that. Mm -hmm. Great to have you on the show today. Thanks for having me, lads. Looking forward to the chat. So we we actually just were talking about uh, you know breakfast versus dinner, and we saw that that's some of your some things you've been talking about uh, more recently. A lot of people are utilizing intermittent fasting, and and they're mm -hmm. you know fasting off until the la later part of the day, and they might eat at like uh, you know four p.m. and then maybe again at like seven p.m. and that might be it for the day. Um, but it may be dark out depending on what time of year it is. If you're eating in some of these, uh, eating windows, uh, have some, some of the results that you've seen, it appears that, uh, eating while it's, uh, while the sun's out <clears throat> might be, uh, might be a better option. So it's, yeah, it's the, the, the sun being out, but also the actual time of day itself. Mm. Um, the thing about these internal biological rhythms that we have uh, is that, they are synchronized to the 24 hour period. Um, and so that provides a lot of adaptability. So if you're in a part of the world, you know, if you're in Sweden or Canada, right. And you, you get this big extreme between your summer light hours and your winter light hours. And depending on the kind of cues that you are giving your, your body, uh, you could still you know, have a situation and most people do where they're still anchored to that, to that time of day, so to speak, to a degree. Um, and what's changed that variable is artificial light. Mm -hmm. that, that's kind of opened up a whole. So what you have, interestingly, for example, is that more people nowadays are what you would call like night owls or evening types. Whereas 20 years ago, more people were kind of just in the middle, really. They weren't extreme morning types. They weren't extreme evening types. So, so what we have is an area of human research that's still pretty kind of early doors with a lot of the different hypotheses and ideas. Um, a lot of previous research in kind of mice and rats, and there was a lot of excitement probably over excitement as you tend to get with like rat studies where it's like look we can shovel calories into these rats but we can just you know time restrict their feeding and they're not going to get they're not going to develop obesity or, or you know or, or get fat and so everyone kind of thought well this is this is the way this you know might operate in humans and you know we know that in reality the reason it's effective for people to kind of shorten the eating window is because it tends to lead to a reduction in total energy intake. But in, in terms of the timing of that eating window, you know, we do have differences in our metabolic responses earlier in the day versus later in the day. And, and that's quite well established, particularly for glucose levels. Now, does that matter for an otherwise healthy individual who's 
you know, uh, presuming, you know, a lot of a lot of your audience, like there are people who are strength training athletes um, and, you know, pr probably to be honest, time restricted feeding wouldn't suit a lot of them because their sheer amount of energy they need to get into the day. You know, trying to squeeze that in in four hours in the evening is not going to be great. But, you know, for otherwise healthy people, there, there are some differences that we could see. And what's always difficult is, you know, we look at a, a study and we say, okay, well, the difference is not that great in otherwise healthy people. The question then is, but what's the effect of that over 20 years? You know, so we always need to kind of think about how we contextualize research. But yeah, I mean, there, there are differences that we can see, particularly for glucose and insulin responses to meals that are uh, kind of amplified in the early part of the day. Um, and a bit impaired later in the day. And um, specifically, we see that become more important as people get more glucose intolerant. So the potential real benefit to interventions like time-restricted feeding could really be in people that are pre-diabetic or, or already have uh, type 2 diabetes, for example. So it's an interesting area, yeah. Okay, so there's so there's so much that we're going to be able to talk to talk about during this podcast. But the first thing that I want to ask you was what you mentioned as far as night owls are concerned, because of artificial light. Sure, um, people are doing things much later, light out much later, uh, and you said that that's an area of research that hasn't been like you know gone into as much. But what would you think is more ideal for those individuals? Would it be trying to figure out how to have their nutrition favor that lifestyle and i know there are some individuals that work at night nurses mm -hmm. um they can't just they can't just change that but the people that sure. can would it be more ideal to like tailor their nutrition to that or to try to flip things in terms of maybe not being a night owl getting out of artificial right. like what do you think would be better and healthier in the long run from what you know so far right so so we have some clues to answer that, I mean, the first thing is that it, fighting against someone's internal biology is not a good idea. We we know that the 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 system, you know, or their kind of circadian system, our system of circadian rhythms, it is flexible, right? It can adapt, and and everyone listening probably knows that it can adapt because if you've ever flown from New York to LA, or you know, LA to London or Sydney, you know, you've experienced jet lag, and you get over it as shit for a few days, but you know, you eventually adapt. So you adapt to this new light and dark cycle. You adapt to these new time cues you're giving yourself, but there are limits to your natural rhythms in terms of how far that can be adaptable. And so you, you we have a phenomenon that's emerged in the research known as social jet lag. So for someone who's a late chronotype, for example, or a late, a night owl, uh, if they, for example, have kids they need to get to school in the morning or they've got a commute that takes like an hour to get to work, this term social jet lag describes the difference in the timing and the amount of, of sleep that someone who's, uh, for example, a night owl gets when they have complete control over their schedule. So like free days or weekends mm -hmm. versus working days. And what you tend to see is that on days they're allowed to sleep just kind of to their own preference, they'll go to bed later, they'll sleep later. But during the working week, because they're not tired in the evening, they don't go to bed earlier, they don't compensate by going, to, so they still stay awake and go to bed at the same time, but then the alarm's going off at 5, 6 a.m. and there's this big disconnect. And there's some interesting research that links the greater amount of social jet lag that an individual has to greater risk of metabolic disease basically. So if fighting against biology probably isn't a great idea on this. I think that someone, and there was an interesting study published last year, which looked at what they called a chronotype adjusted diet. So they categorized people based on their preference, their time of day preference, and then they tailored their energy intake and timing accordingly. And both groups lost an equal amount of, of weight. It was a weight loss intervention, even though the late group were eating slightly more energy later in the day overall. So I think the best uh, preference as far as we know now would be to try and actually tailor 
things to your your kind of preferences. But we know that there's a limit to that flexibility because irrespective of whether someone's a night owl or morning type, night shift work, for example, we know that, you know, eating at 3 a.m. just doesn't work for, for anybody, irrespective of whether they, you know, are, are slightly kind of more night owl than morning type. So, you know, shift work's a pretty, a pretty difficult one. Um, and it, it really just depends. Some people find eating on night shifts is really a comfort thing. It helps them get through the shift. Um, so yeah, th there's there's a whole bag of stuff to get into with shift work. But yeah, I think in general, from what your question is, someone is better off not trying to completely change their preference, their time of day preference, um, because in doing so, they might actually just, uh, you know, cause themselves to be more tired, less 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 functional, you know, during the day, and they might be eating at times they're not hungry, and all of this all of this kind of stuff. So when it comes to nutrition, like we know at the very basic level, like you just can't, you can't have an onslaught of eating. Uh, even if you're trying to eat quote unquote healthy, uh, you sure. can't just completely obliterate food all day long. It sounds to me like in some of the podcasts I listened to that, that had you uh, on the show, um, you were, I think you were just being very basic about it. And I really, I really like that because I think people just, they need something simple, you know, and right. I think sometimes fasting and sometimes people get confused on how to do it and stuff, but simply having some sort of time restricted eating, time restricted feeding during the day, people are probably just not used to that. They're probably wake up um, right. and they probably like go to food right away or they, or they maybe take a shower and then. Uh, right when they come home from work at night, they probably eat something and they probably have like either dessert or some sort of snack. And by the time the whole day is gone, they may have been they may have been awake for 16 hours or so, uh, but they may have eaten the entire time. And it sounds like some of your suggestion is just like, hey, can we can we uh, reasonably get that down to like 12 or 10? And I sure. think that that's a wonderful compromise for people. I, I, I think so. If you look at. Um the US or even the UK, uh, which are quite similar in terms of dietary trends, what you tend to see is that most people spend about 16 hours a day in a fed state. <laughs> that's a long portion of the day. And that's essentially, wow. like you said, it's every Scratching waking, their heads, wondering why they're fat. <laughs> every, every waking minute, you know, <laughs> so, um, people are in a fed state. And, you know, even, even, you know, from the perspective of, you know, someone who is otherwise like not overweight, you know, at a given point in time, the question is like the metabolic effects of that over, you know, over 10, 20 years and how that might add up. And I think that when it comes to something like time restricted feeding, I, I you know, much of what we have focused on in nutrition has been you know the diet right what diet's best and this that and the other and you know for the vast majority of people unless they have a medical condition or or a real strong personal preference or an ethical or or kind of you know moral or environmental consideration like most of that is is irrelevant right so you can you can pick any diet lose weight you know once once energy is accounted for and this kind of thing but people struggle with prescriptive diets they struggle with adherence for multiple reasons they struggle with the idea that you know there's for most people in the population general people in the population there's this idea of what foods are good or bad for weight loss right now, most people i think fitness minded would be like well that there's no real such thing but for most people in the population they need strategies that are accessible that are a simple heuristic for which they can consider what their eating behavior is through and time restricted eating provides a really simple accessible heuristic for people to think about well i'll eat between this time and this time and there are different ways to achieve that right you can compress the eating window symmetrically you could delay breakfast by 90 minutes you could bring your dinner forward by 90 minutes or you could eat early in the day and you know, bring bring dinner forward so that your ear it's more early time restricted eating, or you could delay breakfast and have a, a window later in the day. Um, and we don't really have any good evidence that suggests that one is necessarily superior to the other at this point. So you've got options, and I do think that the 
real world applicability of this is one of the things that makes it attractive as an intervention because it's really taking people's mind off what to eat so to speak um, and they're focusing more on a behavior that they can engage with on a day-to-day basis one thing i'd like to add to that is like you know people are having a hard time making the correct decisions you know kind of over and over again when they eat four or five times a day uh, maybe they're choosing bad snacks and maybe they're but this is so black and white this is just you're just not eating there's a time period where you just there's no food involved so it it gets to be harder to make a mistake and even if you're time restricted feeding let's just say it was like a five hour window if the first meal that you had was relatively healthy and pretty high in protein i would say you could probably have a reasonable meal the next the next meal could be something that you really enjoy as long as you're not you know going way way overboard but I would think sure. that, that would be reasonable. That would cut down your calories. And I think that that would be an effective strategy for a lot of people that are that are overweight now. And they would be able to lose a lot of weight by following some of this protocol. Because by having that restricted feeding, we're probably getting rid of snacks. And we're just going to switch yeah. over to meals. We're probably getting rid of sodas and things like that that people are drinking. And you're probably getting rid of a tremendous amount of calories. The uh, frappuccino they have in the morning that has 300 right. calories in it. And uh, I, I think I think I think uh, this is fantastic because it it can lead people to something simple that they can follow along with. Right, and I think when you look at the characteristics of of diets in a lot of kind of Western industrialized countries, what you see in terms of patterns of energy intake is one, like you just said, massive contribution of daily energy from snacks for most people in the population. Um, And these are snacks occurring between what we would consider main meals. And then you've also got a lot of discretionary energy intake comes in the evening after people have had dinner. So that's a big one, right? So people are just sitting around. They've actually had a dinner meal at seven, for example, or eight, which isn't exactly late, but it's all of this discretionary energy intake that's coming in after their dinner before they go to bed. And, you know, we do have some early research that's suggesting that actually that proximity of food intake to, to, to bedtime basically is, is a factor that might actually, you know, over time add up to increased body fat. So I think that when we look at those patterns of energy intake, and the emphasis on snacking and discretionary calories throughout the day, but particularly in the evening, then yeah, something like time-restricted eating, again, provides a pretty accessible idea for people to grasp. And one that just by shrinking the window, even to like, you know, 10, 11 hours, which is not unreasonable, you're cutting out a lot of that by default, particularly if you've got an evening cutoff of saying, well, I, you know, my 7 p.m. is my is my evening cutoff. Then you've just got a simple rule where, you know, when the potato chips and whatever are coming out at nine because you're going for another Netflix round, like you've got something that says this may be something that I'm not going to do. Can we talk about the actual effects that maybe eating much closer to bedtime might cause? Like, um, does it cause effects on sleep? And you you mentioned over time, it could lead to weight gain. So, So why is that? And also to add on to that, let's say that two people, um, have the same metabolic rate. They're eating the same amount of food, but one person eats a bulk of that food before they go to sleep or close to when they go to sleep, right? Let's say like an hour, um, what would that be an effect in the long run? Mm, okay, so you've heard of melatonin, the mm-hmm. hormone. So, so what's starting to emerge, and this is early doors with this, the first study on this was published in 2017. So there's still a little bit to go, but we know that there's a relationship between melatonin, even if someone's exposed to, to kind of bright light in the evening, which will suppress it, but it will still rise And melatonin is one of the core hormones that anchors our circadian rhythm. It's it's what needs to readjust to a new time zone when we have jet lag. So generally it's low during the day and it starts to rise then in the, in the evening. And it, it really is kind of preparing us for sleep, although it's doing other stuff. And because the rise in melatonin signals to the body that we're entering the nocturnal fasting phase in humans and that elevation means there are other impacts on metabolism. And in particular, really, there, there seems to be a relationship between melatonin and insulin. So when melatonin is elevated, insulin action is impaired 
and glucose tolerance is impaired. And a number of studies have actually found, and, and going back to this idea that you've individual difference in your biological timing, one way you can see that difference is by measuring melatonin in people. So a, a morning type would have an earlier rise of melatonin in the evening, whereas like a late type would have a later, a delayed elevation in melatonin. And what's interesting is over the years, the research on calorie intake in the evening was sometimes inconsistent. You had some studies that suggested this, this big increase, you know, increase in your risk for overweight or obesity, and then some that didn't. And what might explain that discrepancy is none of them measured melatonin. And a number of studies recently have looked at measured melatonin relative to people's midpoint of calorie intake, like when in the day do they hit 50% of their energy, meaning the rest of their 50% is coming after that. And what they found was that calorie intake in close proximity to someone's elevation in melatonin, the timing of that was associated with higher, I think the group eating there uh, with a later midpoint and consuming more calories in close proximity to the rise in melatonin had an average body fat of 32%. Whereas the ones with it earlier had an average body fat of 22. Wow. So that's, that's not a minor difference. And what it could be to, to just bring in the part of the question where you're saying, what would be the effect to people, similar body size, similar metabolic rate, all of this stuff, you know, what would be the effect of consuming the same meal in terms of calories and composition? One say has it at, you know, seven and another has 10 o'clock, for example, if there was a very tightly controlled metabolic ward study last year that, that looked pretty much at that. And again, they didn't measure melatonin, but you saw this really exaggerated glucose response and insulin response to the 10 p.m. meal. But glucose remained elevated throughout the night while they were asleep to a much greater degree than the 7 p.m. dinner. So, so you're basically asking your body, your metabolism to process nutrient intake, energy intake at a time when it's, it's not expecting energy intake at all, right? So over again, this is something that if we looked at that and thought about, you know, the effects of continually elevated glucose, and if someone was doing this habitually over and over, um, this nightly impaired glycemic and insulin response, then, you know, it, it does give us a mechanism. Interestingly, the late night eating or, or evening distribution of energy is more strongly associated with diabetes than it is with any other chronic disease. And, and this is giving us a plausible biological mechanism through which that might be actually occurring. What do you do for fun, Alan? Do you just put these uh, studies on flashcards or what? <laughs> Uh, I would power lift if I wasn't in a lockdown. But. <laughs> oh, I absolutely yeah. love uh, that you got this brain because my brain doesn't work that way. I'll hear stuff. I'll hear a lot of the stuff that you say today. And unfortunately, I'll be lucky if I can walk away with one or two percent of it. Um, so you're, you're like, I like what you're saying a lot. And I think, you know, years ago when I started to get into uh, fitness and started to learn about nutrition, I remember there was somebody that said, like, don't eat carbs past, and they just gave you, like, a time. And I want to say they said, right. like, 7 p.m. or something like that. Do you think, like, a strategy like that? So my thoughts on a strategy like that is it might just get rid of snacks for you, and it might just get rid of uh, you overeating at night. It might it might be, like, a strategy. Not that you can never eat them, but just to kind of have a, a rule of thumb, like, hey, he should probably at least cut back the carbohydrates. And if you already eat carbohydrates later on in the evening, uh, maybe it's because it's after a workout or maybe it's uh, in the form of like vegetables or something like that. You think kind sure. of following a rule like that, um, you know, might assist some people. I, I think it depends on, on the person, to be honest, like it's, it's difficult to see what, what, you know, rules necessarily would benefit any given individual. What right. I like about say time restricted eating is the fact that it's not necessarily it, it is a rule, sure, but the kind of additional dietary considerations like carbs, no carbs, fat, no fat, all this kind of stuff, they, they kind of become secondary considerations to, to the eating window, which is why it's more accessible for people in the real world. 
I think when you look at the research on glucose tolerance, it's, there's a very clear difference between morning and evening. Um, you know, people simply process carbohydrate better in the early part of the day than in the evening. Um, that's much more uh, pronounced in people with impaired glucose tolerance or diabetes. But generally speaking, we would observe that difference in healthy people as well. It's just the actual magnitude of the difference isn't huge. So, you know, does someone need to avoid carbs in the evening? Not necessarily carbohydrate type matters. There's a big difference between sitting down to uh, lentils or sitting down to jellies, right? So, you know, I think I think the qualitative uh, aspect of carbohydrate is is going to be an important consideration. Um, and, and, and we could say the same for dietary fat. And we know that the circadian rhythm in your circulating triglycerides actually peaks in the evening. So, you know, the idea of having fat loads in, in, you know, in the, in the evening or close to bedtime is, is not a great idea either because Mm -hmm. it will impair your postprandial fat metabolism. You get this really, and that's one of the reasons from a dietary perspective, although there are a number of risk factors for, for shift work, one of the reasons why cardiovascular disease risk might be particularly high in night shift workers, amongst others, is because of this you know, eating during the biological night and like impaired postprandial or post-meal fat metabolism. So, you know, I think it's important to p- try and put times on this as well for people because people just start hearing evening and they're just like, shit, like, I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm never going to eat past 5 p.m. again. Mm. And, and that's not really what, what we're saying. I mean, the, the evening is, is, is a broad period. And it, yes, there's going to be inter, inter-individual difference. Um, but as far as most of the research goes now, whether it's observational or even controlled interventions, that overall, there is you know, the, 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 the kind of direction that it's pointing in is suggesting that having the bulk of your energy earlier in the day, having your peak energy intake earlier in the day, say, for example, before 3 p.m., give or take, would be, and that doesn't need to be breakfast. That could be, you look at some of the continental or Mediterranean dietary patterns, they have a kind of lighter breakfast, but then this peak energy intake with lunch, the main meal in the middle of the day, smaller dinner. What you see in the UK and the US um, and some other industrialized countries like Australia is really a, a, a pattern of energy intake that you don't see anywhere else, which is energy at subsequent meals gets higher as the day goes on, breakfast, lunch is bigger, than, and it peaks in the evening. And you, you just don't really see that in a lot of dietary patterns, In certainly in, in dietary patterns we would associate with health outcomes like the Mediterranean or, say, kind of traditional Japanese diet. Now, with what you said there, I, I have a question that might, um, eh, I, I think it relates for some individuals, as far as their lifestyle is concerned, some people um, don't like eating big meals, maybe in the morning or the afternoon, because they feel a little bit of a lull afterwards. So my sure. curiosity with, for, for you here is like, is there a strategy to those meals or a strategy to like, some people have the luxury of being able to take a nap in the afternoon after they have a meal, like right. a 30 minute nap people that work a nine to five can't necessarily take a nap. Right. So what is, how can people strategize those meals so that they don't feel sluggish or potentially tired Mm. afterwards? Yeah. And you, again, you look at some cultures that do have that peak afternoon intake and they've got like a siesta afterwards, this kind of thing. So, but yeah, most people in a kind of typical nine to five, that's, that's not an option. Um, so I think there's, there's, there's two components to this. One, there's actually a circadian component. We tend to have, so we, we talk about circadian rhythms, which are biological rhythms that are aligned to the 24 hour day. And then we have these cool things called ultradian rhythms, which are little rhythms that go along during the day, right? And they often tend to go roughly with a kind of period of about 90 minutes. Mm. So um, generally, give or take about six to eight hours after someone has woken up, people will have a slump. They'll, they'll just have a dip. And that's considered one of these kind of like just natural dips in the day. But then there's also the effect of, you know, a large volume of food. Everyone knows after Christmas dinner, right? It's like nap on the couch or Thanksgiving dinner. So we, we do have an effect where, 
you know, there's blood flow to the stomach. There's all of these kind of aspects of eating a big meal that make a bit of lethargy, you know, a common kind of phenomenon in that post meal period. I think people can maybe think about dietary composition in this context. So like higher protein meals um, can be something that, you know, people often find they're kind of fuller uh, on, a, on a, a lower kind of overall energy intake and, you don't tend to get that slump protein is obviously quite thermogenic. So you get that kind of postprandial thermogenic response. And so that can be one factor to consider. Um, the, the other as well is to just, I get this question a lot because um, more, from morning types, people are like, well, if I wake in the morning, you know, does that mean I have to eat instantly? And, you know, my general answer to that is no. Like, so I would fall into kind of morning type and I tend to wake at say six ish. And I get up, but I'm never hungry before nine to 10 o'clock. So I'm still extending a morning fast. It's just relative to me getting up at 6 a.m. I'm still not eating for three hours. Now, that's my own personal anecdote, but it's an example of how, you know, the idea behind this is not necessarily that you have to like eat immediately (laughs) upon waking. You know, you can still kick that back and you can think about how you time that energy intake over over the course of, of, of your day. And maybe manipulate diet composition as well and kind of, you know, focus more on kind of complex carbohydrate or, you know, vegetables, high fiber kind of carbohydrate, protein, um, you know, good fats, this kind of thing. So I think there is room for people that are going beyond this because I'm assuming, you know, your listeners aren't like gen pop, you know. (laughs) So, you know, we can kind of take this concept a little further and actually talk about manipulating diet composition in in a way that could avoid that like, you know, 2 p.m. slump after after a big meal. You're uh, unfortunately, you're unbelievably reasonable. So I don't think anybody's ever going to listen to you because <laughs> in the nutrition <laughs> yeah, space, you got to be right, a little yeah, bit of a quack, it. you know? Yeah, yeah, that's it. I, can, I need to tell everyone to eat within an hour or something. You got to tell know? them to eat like this exact time every day. And that's right. the only way to do yeah. it. Otherwise, they're going to blow up or something right. explode. Um, well, well, what's it, what's interesting about that? Um, sorry to cut across, but yeah. I, I just, I've, I've always found that when it comes to some of the like intermittent fasting kind of protocols or like, I remember coming across a thing called the warrior diet and like, mm. there's the, a lot of this like evolutionary speculation that, you know, man would have got up and gone hunting for the day and has his main meal in the evening. And I'm like, there is metabolically no sense to that based on what we know about human metabolism. Like there's literally who, who, who makes these things up, but because it's speculating about our evolutionary past, you can fill in the blanks with whatever shit you want. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And it seems like what you're sharing is just like, Hey, you know what? Just try to, you know, work on having some sort of time restricted feeding, whatever time you can make it work would be great. But if it can fall into a pattern that, uh, you know, um, meets our circadian rhythm that might be a little bit superior you might have a small edge i think that's great because people kind of need to do what they need to do otherwise they can't comply otherwise they can't you know they can't move forward and uh and lose weight in the first sure. place sure and, and i think for me as well it's it's impossible to be in this kind of area of research and and not see the importance of these related factors right so yeah i, I study kind of chrononutrition but like you, you, you can't divorce that from sleep and the importance of sleep, for example. Um, you know, when I look at social jet lag, you know, touching on what we talked about earlier, I, I, I think, you know, how debilitating that must be if you're someone who does work a nine to five, for example, and you're a, you know, you're, you're, you're a kind of midnight 1am bed person. And if you were on your own, with no alarm, you'd sleep maybe from one to like nine thirty, right? And that's your that's your rhythm, and you feel good. You come into your own in your brain, kind of mid afternoon, late afternoon, early evening, um, and you're faced with a situation where you have to have an alarm scream you out of bed at six a.m. because you need to get up and shower and, and get kids ready and then get a commute how knackered you'd be by Friday evening, Mm. like, and how that would affect your ability to train your motivation to train, how we know that it affects people's decision-making with food. It, it affects even in the brain. We know that that kind of sleep curtailment affects people's sensitivity to food signals, right? You're walking by a coffee shop, you smell donuts. It's just like, Mm -hmm. you've no defense at that point. (laughs) Your brain is just because 
the hypothesis is that your brain is is conscious of the of the level of fatigue that you have and is looking for quick quick hit energy basically can that have so, an impact on your uh on your hormones when you just smell food uh, it was my understanding that you might release some insulin even just from smelling food i'm not sure if that's I, I, true i or think not. there was the hypothesis i don't i there there, there is <laughs> some like ain't that a bitch? You didn't even eat it. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I don't think in response to the stimuli, but I do think if I remember that you know, with, certainly with the circadian stuff, is like part of the reason you have certain responses is because if you're consistent <laughs> with your diet, right, you get this essentially anticipation. That's what <laughs> circadian rhythms allow you to do is to anticipate changes in the environment. So, yeah, uh, I think we can. You know, I think we could say that the, the issue with the donut is, is not necessarily that smelling it might release insulin, is that eating three of them might mm. actually just right, right. <laughs> contribute to, you know, 12, 1200 calories or whatever. As far as uh, the, and like the chronotype is, you know, it, it's like if you're a morning person or if you're a night owl, right? That's what you sure. chronotype, right? So my question is, how easy? is it or how potentially difficult is it for someone to change their chronotype i mean can you change it can you like i mean you can try to or go how to do sleep you even earlier. know it or how yeah. do you like yeah how do you even know it like could you just try to go to sleep earlier often and then you can shift it or are you right. the way you are you you most of the research suggests you are the way you are in that sense like even if we factor in the adaptability in the system which is there because yeah you you fly to, you know, if we take a, a late chronotype and they go from London, where I am, to LA, you know, once they've adapted, they're still a late chronotype, <laughs> they, right? So they've got over the jet lag, but their actual timing of, of their, their biological rhythms is, is the same because there's genetic underpinnings to this stuff as well um, that we're starting to, to learn more about. Um, even breakfast intake, the desire to eat more early in the day might have a genetic underpinning. So there was a there was a gene, a genetic study from a chrono group in Spain two years ago that took twins and basically looked at like whether, you know, breakfast, desire to eat breakfast, for example, or different meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner had any sort of genetic underpinning. And what they found was that breakfast itself had a really big heritability component genetically whereas dinner didn't really. Mm. And this was an, an interesting study because what it suggested was that people with a strong preference for breakfast, uh, you know, probably have that as some sort of you know, kind of underpinning. It's more genetic, but dinner is probably more modifiable. It, it's, it's, it doesn't have a strong genetic underpinning. It's probably more mo a modifiable behavior. So I thought that was interesting, mm. but yeah, th there are, limits to the extent to which you can you can change it and like i said if, if you were to try and force yourself from being a, a night owl into a, a morning type you probably just be basically subjecting yourself to social jet lag in the process and you wouldn't be getting any beneficial adaptive response out of it and i think I, i'm i'm i want to know about this if if because some listeners, right, Mark asked a question, like, how do you even know if you are? Because I feel like there are lifestyle effects. Like if you're a person um, who, let's say that you actually are a morning person, but most of your social life happens at night. So, you know, on a weekly basis, all your friends like to go out and like have some drinks mm -hmm. and have dinner. And this all happens on weekdays at like 10, 11 PM. That's your social time. So you never skip it, but you, your chronotype technically would actually be a morning person, right? How does an sure. individual know the differences of like, this is, I'm, I'm doing like, I'm having these issues because of my lifestyle versus I'm having these issues because of my chronotype. Right. It's a mix. It's the interaction between chronotype and, and, and environment. And, and we have more input now from there's kind of three ways of thinking about clocks in a way, time, biological time. There's biological time, which is what we're talking about. And then there's like solar time, time of day, which is the light dark cycle. And that's relative to where you are in the world. And then there's social time. And generally our social time in modern society is largely organized around the industrial revolution, right? Factory hours, nine to five, 
church, school start times, this kind of thing. So our, our kind of, uh, you know, uh, our, our, a lot of our social clocks in that sense are geared more towards either people who are neutral or, or early types. But, but social life is something that because of the workday timing very much for most people occurs in the evening, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, unless you're going to like a football game on a Saturday morning or something like that, or a Sunday morning, you know, so, you know, most of our socializing is, is, is nocturnal or evening based. And although much of the research is focused on the negative impacts of being a late chronotype in terms of social jet lag or even eating patterns, we tend to forget that morning types, particularly very early morning types, can have the same negative effect if they're trying to keep a social life that has them out till midnight. You know, the effect for that person, they're usually in bed by nine, you know, and waking up at five or six. And the effect of like a night out or extended or having to work late is going to have the same effect where it's going to basically be eating into when they would otherwise like to be asleep. So how do you find out? There's questionnaires you could, you can get, for example, the Munich Chronotype Questionnaire. People could Google that. They could mm. they could do that self administer, um, and yeah, there, there's a number of Chronotype Questionnaires that that you can get and you can help determine. And really, when people are doing it, what they'll realize is a lot of this is very intuitive, right? So the questions are like, if you had the complete freedom what time would you go to bed at? If you had complete freedom, what time would you wake up at? If you had complete freedom, when would you like start work day, for example? When do you feel most alert during the day? You know, all this kind of stuff. And really it's getting people to just actually think about their own kind of preferences. But there are people that may be based on how they kind of live lifestyle wise that could be just so unattuned to, to their, you know, because they're just constantly overriding it. And they're just like living on caffeine and, you know, never get enough sleep and all this kind of stuff. There are people like that, obviously, but, you know, again, I'm sure most of your listeners are pretty much, you know, taking sleep seriously is something that aids recovery and performance. And yeah, we're all going to have nights out. We're all going to have, you know, the wedding where we get to bed at five or 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. But it's really, again, like most things, it's kind of what you do over time that, that adds up and not, not those kind of random variables yeah, is in there, the mix. Is there a, um, like any statistics or like a ratio on percentages of people that are, you know, uh, like the night owls versus the, the early risers? Because sure. I, I have this feeling that there's going to be a, a lot of people that are like, oh, I'm definitely on the, uh, the later chrono type because, you know, X, Y, and Z. But in reality, maybe they just have poor sleep habits and they're not taking sleep seriously. So, so as a percentage, if we factor in kind of, you know, all of the evening kind of hours there, I think if I remember correctly, it's like 41 to 46% of people would fall into evening types. Now, the percentage of them that are extreme evening types, you know, the kind of people that maybe go to bed at two and, and sleep later is, is very small, right? less than 5%. Mm -hmm. um, uh, give or take about 20% are morning types and kind of the rest kind of fall in the middle. And, and there's nuance within that, right? Like I said, because evening's a broad category. So you've got people that are kind of earlier evening, later evening. And morning is the same. You know, you'll have people that are awake at, you know, 4 a.m. and getting up and you'll have people that kind of wake up maybe seven. Um, so as a percentage, it's definitely, uh, you know, nearly kind of half or, or certainly just about a third of the population falls into that bracket. But you're absolutely correct because I do find that people are often saying, oh, well, I, I think I'm just a late type because I'm awake and, you know, I, I feel active in the evening or, mm -hmm. Or they're like, I'm tired in the evening and I can't sleep, which is a big giveaway. And this is the effect of environmental stimuli that we have is people are, are a little divorced from that. So I'm like, well, if you're sitting in front of a 60 inch plasma and it's blurting out like your, and your eat and your, you know, your phone is six inches from your face and you've all of these, your, your body doesn't know it's a phone. Your, your, your retina detects light and spectrums of light and it relays that information to your brain right it's it's not going oh this light doesn't count because it's from my smartphone <laughs> like so so i think that people's exposures in the evening have a big part to play 
in kind of influencing how they feel. Um, and generally speaking, I, I think even for, for late chronotypes, it's a good idea to try and be mindful of things like light exposure and stuff in the evening. Um, and, and people might get a bit more kind of in tune, so to speak, with, with how they actually feel in the evening as opposed to actually having a stimulus come in. Um, you know, that has a, has a stimulating effect on your wakefulness um, and your kind of your, your brain. Is there research on uh, like really condensed time restricted feeding? I know like some people do like one meal a day, but is there like some research behind maybe just like a sure. two or three hour eating window or something like that? There is some, there was a study published uh, towards the end of last year, which compared a four hour and a six hour window. Mm. And the four hour window was from, I think, um, two to 6 p.m. or something like that. And the six hour window was maybe from three to uh, seven or eight. And um, both, both groups reduced energy pretty similarly. There was no real difference. Uh, both groups lost the same amount of weight. Both groups had pretty similar improvements in glucose tolerance. So it, it really doesn't. And some of the other studies, for example, have, can, have, have looked at six hour time restricted feeding or eight. It doesn't seem like that two hour difference is, is that material, which is why I think for most people, you know, even 10 or 11 hours is probably beneficial. Mm. And the, the greater restriction probably isn't necessary but again it depends i mean is is it preference is it you know just a, a really simple tool for someone to be able to drastically kind of drop energy intake if we're talking about diabetes management or pre-diabetes then it's different considerations they probably want to front load their energy intake and have have most of that kind of early in the day because the improvement in their overall 24-hour blood glucose levels is, is much greater in, in if they have that kind of distribution of energy. But as far as the super tight windows go, you know, most of the research hasn't gone lower than four hours, I think. Anything, um, on, <clears throat> anything on OMAD diet? Any information on like research that you've seen on just a one meal a day? I haven't seen anything on just specifically one meal a day. Um, unless you're thinking about the 5-2 type fasting, uh, which, which was... Then? basically born out of the what you what what's known as the alternate day fasting and that was basically people eat normally with no restrictions on on one day and then the next day they completely forego all calorie containing food or or drinks mm. and so every second day you're fasting and and with the ADF um you know there there were improvements in some metabolic markers but they weren't what you would expect for such a dramatic intervention, right? And also they didn't lose as much weight as you might expect because there was compensatory intake on the, on the non-fasting days. And also the self-reported hunger and cravings and everything was through. So it was considered probably not a great intervention. Um, and it was modified so that you only fast two days a week, but you have maybe 500 calories on that day, it's kind of like a modified alternate day fast. And there's, again, a couple of studies using that type of protocol. It, it doesn't, the intermittent fasting, as opposed to time-restricted feeding, where with, with and people always go, well, what's the difference? Well, with TRF or TRE, you're keeping the same window every day and relatively the same meal timing within that window every day. So it's daily, whereas with intermittent fasting, you know, it could just be two out of seven days a week or one day or, or, or this kind of thing. And, and even that day that people fast on could be different from day to day uh, or from week to week. But the, 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 those kind of modified fasting protocols, I'm just, for what it involves, I'm not particularly impressed by the benefit that people get from it in terms of metabolic improvements or even weight loss. What about um, the fasting mimicking diet from, uh, I think it's uh, Walter Longo or is, yeah. is, that, is that his name? Yeah. That's, that's really, I mean, that, that's a fascinating area generally. And what I like about Longo's research is that he's really built it up from every level. You know, he started with animal models, got a kind of basic 
you know, mechanism that he thought could be useful in humans and brought it into human trials. And um, what I, what, what's really difficult to extrapolate is the fact that the FMD has been designed specifically as an adjuvant intervention for people undergoing chemotherapy. Mm. So, you know, how, how do we say what benefit that has in otherwise healthy people? Like, it's impossible. Um, the, the research on the FMD in humans so far is, is quite interesting. The suggestion that, for example, the five days of the kind of uh, fasting mimicking diet kind of primes the body that when there's a refeed subsequent to that, they, they seem to get this boost in, you know, white blood cell production and, and some of this stuff that then assists with obviously the, the overall uh, process of, of, of chemotherapy and otherwise. So I think it's one of those areas where it's, it's pretty fascinating anyway, just to talk, talk about. Um, I think it's, got encouraging enough preliminary results in the limited human studies that they've done to warrant further investigation. Would it benefit someone who's otherwise healthy? Um, I don't know. Per perhaps. I mean, what, what tends to be over extrapolated in the fasting time restricted feeding kind of circadian rhythm space is the whole longevity thing. Right. And it's just mm -hmm. like, oh, look, you know, lifespan increased with 30% energy restriction. I was like, yeah, it's a mouse. Like, you, you probably are going to gain, what, 30 minutes on your lifespan if we, if we extrapolated, you know, the, 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 the gain that the mouse got. So uh, would stuff like this help people, you know, live longer? I don't, I don't know that we'll ever actually be able to, to say one way or the other. And, uh, you know, for me, if I was really thinking about my longevity, I think I'd be focusing more on things like, you know, my sleep hygiene, my kind of day to day trying to be as in kind of, yeah, sync with the things we know that promote health rather than the things that might and are completely speculative. You know, since we've been talking about like doing things close to sleep and like how eating food close to bed is, has an effect. Um, how, what, what, what about exercise? Like, what about the people who like, they can't exercise in the morning, they have to work. So maybe they end up exercising two, three hours, or maybe even an hour before they try to go to sleep. Do, sure. do you have, like, does the research show any positive, negative effects of that? So I think, you know, a lot of what we're talking about, we're, we're talking about in the context of kind of wider general application. Mm -hmm. And I think when it comes to getting a bit more granular for, for athletes, recreational or otherwise, then I think the considerations change. I mean, we know that exercise dramatically alters your you know, metabolic landscape, your insulin independent glucose uptake, all of these factors. And so for someone who can't train in the morning and gets to the gym at seven or eight, you know, and lifts for 90 minutes or two, you know, I, I, I think we can say that the effect of that intervention at that point is to change their metabolic physiology. We, we know that that will be the case. So, um, but when I've had this conversation before trying to factor in the athletic context, I still think it's a good idea overall for that person to still have had the majority, the bulk of their energy leading up to training. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we know that, you know, they don't need a huge calorie uh, intake to maximize muscle protein synthesis or glycogen resynthesis. So they could still have the bulk of their energy intake up to that point and then have like a, you know, a shake or like a kind of, you know, pro protein rich enough to kind of stimulate the muscle protein synthesis response without having a huge energy load, you know, right, right, right before bed. But um, yeah, generally the, you know, their metabolic response to food intake after training is going to be completely different to someone who's entirely sedentary eating at 10 PM because of the effect of, of, you know, a, a training bout on, on their physiology. And then also um, I'm curious, since we've been talking about life so much, or not life, light, um, how you personally like guard yourself in terms of light in the evenings, TV, et cetera. Do you use those blue blockers? Like what do you put within your life to help with that? Yeah. So I, 
have blue blockers. I have two two pairs. I have a, a, a pair that are clear in terms that they just look like reading glasses. Mm-hmm. And I'd wear them if I was out and about because you don't look like Bono. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, and they just look like, and they don't block it, the full blue light spectrum, but they block the vast majority of it. So I always think, you're, you know, I'm getting, getting something. And, and generally that's just because I'm out and about, right? I'm not, I'm not out to watch TV. And yeah, for, for, for being about the, the house in the home or what I do have the orange tinted ones as well. And, and we know from research that they are effective. They do block blue light and they do allow your melatonin to rise. They did a, a cool study in kids, well, teenagers, late teenagers playing video games. So they, they were able to control how close they sat to the screen. And they looked at a group wearing blue light blockers and a group just not. And they looked at the timing of their melatonin. And what you got in the people wearing the blockers was they got an earlier rise in melatonin and a, and, a, and a kind of higher peak. So they were getting the kind of rhythm in melatonin that you that you would want to see. So I wear them in the evening. And then I, I just generally have my kind of home light environment pretty dimly lit in the evening. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have bright lights overhead. I have a software which is free to download on the laptop called Flux. Yeah. Um, and that will dim your screen in the evening mm-hmm. as well. And then in the morning, I always try to get kind of 15 minutes of, of outdoor bright light. And even in a climate like, like I'm looking out the window, it is gray and wet. Um, but, but natural light is, is, is quite potent, even when you might not have the ability to see the sun or, or it's a completely overcast day. But for days that it's bucketing rain or in the winter when it's very dark to kind of 8, 8.30, I have a an artificial blue light, um, which I'll just have on while I'm working at the desk. And it, it, it basically shines, um, you know, the a very kind of bright blue light, the same kind of intensity that you would get from a blue sky, essentially. Mm. Um, and I find that really helps in the winter. Um, just even like how kind of, alert and awake you you feel um i have always found a real benefit to the to the blue light um and then you know in the summertime here a lot of these things kind of go out the window because it's it's bright till 10 p.m so i I don't necessarily throw on the blue blockers because it's it's bright outside anyway and it's bright at 5 a.m so i'm always going to get natural light in the morning so a lot of what i'm describing is very much has a seasonal kind of component to it as well, based on the time zone that I'm in. Um, you know, for people that are in places like Australia, where they have this really nice, you know, seven to seven, same, same light dark cycle all year round. It's just like, they, they've got it easy. But if we're in these kind of other climates in the world, you know, we need to think about this stuff a bit. But yeah, so I, I try and, as a simple kind of summary, I try and maximize my exposure to, to bright light natural if possible early in the day and in the evening i try and do the opposite i try and minimize my exposure to intense light and try not to do stuff that's like meant to mentally stimulating kind of in the air before bed um so that there's a bit of a wind down because i'm kind of one of these people everyone's a bit different but like if I go to bed mentally wound up, like I won't sleep, I'll just lie there like just running, running through stuff. <laughs> In studying, uh, you know, nutrition from a chronological standpoint, uh, what have you seen in regards to age? Because, you know, people have their kids and they like um, a lot of households, they're like, oh, we have that junk uh, in the pantry and it's for the kids, the, the <laughs> cheese its and the cookies and the cereal and those things like that. And, you know, I've always kind of said, well, you know, they, they should probably be eating a little bit more similar to us if we can, if we can figure that out. I understand the kids, uh, you know, they want snacks and they want treats and stuff. Their friends have them and stuff like that. What are some of your, like, what have you seen research wise? Do kids actually get away with being able to eat uh, some of this crap or is it more because they move a lot until they're like 10, 12 years old or yeah, what have you seen? Um, there's, there's definitely the energy intake in kids. I mean, you know, kids are generally quite good at at, at matching 
energy intake to kind of energy expenditure for the most part. Mm. You know, that's that's a technically they are. Obviously, the more that kids are exposed to hyper palatable foods, the less that ability they to kind of it, yeah. naturally regulate energy intake gets. What we tend to see as well is this phenomenon where in teenage years, from maybe about 11 or 12 to kind of 18, 19, there's a shift in all teenagers' chronotypes. This is really interesting. So for whatever reason, there's all sorts of little evolutionary theories, but kids, this whole idea of, oh, lazy teenagers sleeping till 10 a.m. No, no, they, they need to sleep till 10 yep. So there's a big conversation in this, in this, in the wider chronobiology uh, research about changing the school start time, for example, mm. because there's just like kids are, you pull kids out of bed at 5 a.m. when their body wants to be asleep and they're, they're, you know, they perform worse on tests and all this kind of stuff. They're tired, so they've got the element of fatigue and lack of kind of uh, regulation that comes with from a dietary component. So there's all these potential knock-on effects of this. But in terms of a lot of what we see in adults, like there's still little chronotype differences in kids. And generally, we still see the same pattern where kids who don't eat till much later in the day tend to have worse overall diet quality. For multiple reasons, they're probably just very hungry by the time they start eating. They tend to distribute more energy to later in the day, the evening, the nighttime, and they tend to have much more of an emphasis on kind of like snacks and hyper palatable foods. So it does seem that that pattern of energy intake in, in adolescence in particular is, is, is broadly associated with a lot of the same outcomes that we'd see in adults. Um, whereas, you know, more regular kind of earlier meal consumption tends to have a positive effect on kind of regulating meal timing and intake, less discretionary snacking. So, yeah, a, a lot of it is slightly similar with the caveat that, that adolescents in particular are naturally going to kind of be a little later with their timing on some of this stuff. Um, in regards to, you know, the, the teenager that does need to sleep in a little bit more, um, can we help? Um, I guess aid that by having just an earlier bedtime or is it just naturally going to happen to where they're just going <laughs> to sleep in late? I mean, th 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 there, this is the difficulty with, with some of this stuff because, you know, how do you get someone to go to bed earlier when they're just not tired? <laughs> right, <laughs> it's like, yeah. Get in there and go to sleep. It's like, I'm not tired. So that's one of the challenges with, with particularly this, this, the adolescence phase and school start times and stuff is, you know, their, their, their natural rhythm at that point in their life is such that they're not really ready to go to bed early. And so they're, they're probably not going to sleep even if you put them to bed. Um, but th there is, there was a study a couple of years ago, which did look at like just bringing bedtime forward by an hour, um, which is not too extreme. And, and that did have a kind of benefit in terms of even like sleep quality. Um, I think for, for teenagers in particular, the research on like their light exposure is, is some, that, that would be and like, if I had a teenage kid, that would be what I'd be trying to have a conversation about is like sleeping with your iPhone under the pillow, <laughs> you know, have, having your notifications going off, being, being, you know, aroused because you're involved in all these conversations back and forth and your, your mental stimulation has peaked all that kind of stuff. And then of course, taking out the phone to have it six inches in front of your face. And that, that'd be all the stuff that I'd be trying to kind of like, you know, mod help modify some behaviors around. Um, but as far as like, you know, really changing the kind of internal uh, biological preference within that age group, I mean, maybe bringing, you know, bedtime forward by an hour could help, but anything, you know, too extreme and they're just simply not going to be in a state where they're even tired or, or kind of ready to, to go to sleep. Yeah. Um, removing some of the, uh, the, the modern technologies that will cause, you know, the, uh, the suppression in melatonin and the, everything you just spoke of, is there an evolutionary reason why humans when we're <laughs> in our late teens that this does happen? So the, theory one of the kind of ones that i've seen relates to and i think this is interesting and in that it, it ties into 
um, like as we age, we need less sleep. Mm -hmm. So one of the theories that I've seen a chronobiologist offer is that if we were, you know, small tribes, 100, 150 people, this kind of thing, um, that kids or adolescents would essentially have been the ones that kind of were the lookout, so to speak, at, at night. Mm -hmm. So this and that perhaps this shift also served a benefit as like that's the age where you start to socialize, you start to become sexually active, you start all this kind of stuff that would be beneficial for humans to start doing, but they wouldn't maybe want to do, you know, with, with mom and dad awake, this kind of thing. So, so there's this kind of theory that from a sociality perspective, right. So from a sociality perspective, they'd be, you know, it'd be better to be sneaking off into the woods to do whatever, you know, when, when, when everyone was asleep, plus also perhaps the idea that, well, someone's going to have to stay up and make sure that no predators arrive, you know, the, 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 the next tribe or, or the wolves don't, don't come to the door. Um, and th that, that's just a theory. I, I, I like, I like playing around sometimes with these different ideas, but there's no, there's no way we'll ever know for sure. What's up everybody. This episode of Mark Bell's Power Project podcast is brought to you by Piedmontese Beef. Yeah. World Carnivore Month is over and I think I'm totally done with meat. No, you're honest. not. I'm going vegan. You're fibbing. No. That's no uh, fake news. Yes, I am actually lying. Told there's, you. there's no reason. I'm going to put all type. Pause. I'm going to eat. Oh. There's no way of saying that I want to eat all types of Piedmont. Especially when beef. dudes are in the room. Yeah. Like a bunch of children. Yeah. Um, well, they have a lot of great cuts of meat. <laughs> there that you have, go. You know, a lot of protein. Uh, some have lower fat, some have higher fat. You really can't lose with the options and they all taste great. So eat all the meat you want, gentlemen. Yeah. And I'll one up and you. Ladies. Yeah. Oh, well, see, here we go. Uh, oh, go ahead and check out the Piedmontese hot dogs because those things are incredible. All right. Hey, yo. <laughs> 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 all right get the piedmontese all beef hot dogs cut them up like you're you know four or five years old trying to eat some hot dogs uh and then enjoy them that way i promise you they're they taste incredible uh they're somehow like they i don't even uh they're super low in fat super high in protein doesn't make any sense all i can say is you need to go try these things out right now head over to piedmontese.com that's P-I-E-D-M-O-N-T-E-S-E dot -E -E com at checkout. Enter promo code Power Project for 25% off your order. And if your order is $99 or more, you get free two-day shipping. <laughs> I was laughing at all of this because I vividly remember every single morning in high school. There was not a single morning that I stayed, stayed awake during the commute to school. Mm. And there wasn't a single first and second period that I wasn't nodding off or totally asleep during the whole class in the back. I've gotten in trouble for that a lot. But now it's not right. because I was lazy or a bad student. <laughs> mm. It's because I was a teenager. Yeah. And that's just naturally Basically, what was supposed about, to happen. How about when your mom comes in your room to wake you up and you got morning wood going on? <laughs> Why aren't you getting up? <laughs> You're like, uh, Get you know. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I got something uh, going on over here that I, I don't yeah. want to expose. You need, you you need to leave. <laughs> I guess we don't knock in this household yeah, anymore. Right, bro. Yeah. I have a horrible story about that. I, oh, man. You know what? I'm just telling now story. I guess is here. When I was younger, here we bro. Oh God, I think I was like, it was the first time. This is why nobody watches our show. By the way, Alan. <laughs> I'm sorry, Alan. I think you'll find this kind of funny, no, but also great. slightly disturbing. Um, I was maybe 11, 10 or 11, and I didn't know what a boner was. Okay, so the first day it happened to me, I was. I was like, what is going on here? It won't leave. Like, no, oh, no. I was like, mm. I was like hitting it and shit and it wasn't going away. Punched it. And then I ran to my mom, single parent household. She's the mother. I was like, mom, mom, what's going on, mom? I don't no know what's way. going on. She's like, Insima, don't, don't worry. <laughs> it's okay. It, it, it's okay. It'll go away. I was like, mom, it's not going down. <laughs> <laughs> that shit really happened, bro. Dude. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm sure you're not the only person. Yeah. 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 That was that was wild. Yeah. That's uh, so good. Yeah. Damn. Then you then you find out what's going on. You're just like, don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Uh, Alan, how do you yeah. eat? You know, like do you uh have specific restrictions for yourself in terms of like what you eat? Do you have a certain style of eating for yourself? Um, I guess a kind of 
Um, so yeah, I think I alluded to, I, I, I guess I do have some degree of like TRE, but that's more of a kind of natural thing as opposed to like, I'm going to eat within X hours of window. And what about choices I, I of food? Uh, so I think my diet would probably be fairly moderate across the board. I'm obviously always thinking, I don't track anything anymore. I, tra I tracked for years and you get to a point of kind of nutrition knowledge and, you know, take, you know, that I don't need to track to know, you know, how much yogurt is going to give me 20 grams of protein kind of right. thing, you know? So, um, and I just started to enjoy cooking more. So I was just like, mm. I don't want to like get to dinner and uh, have these macros dictating what I can, what I can eat. So, um, I tend to generally, uh, you know, think about obviously, you know, if I'm training, um, you know, I'll, 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 I'll eat to fuel that. I think my diet would be, you know, would it be carb based? Not necessarily. I think it would be kind of moderate protein. Probably I'd say the predominant macronutrients, probably carbohydrate. Um, and I'd say I have pretty moderate fat. So like typical day of eating for me, I'll have a, a bowl of oats, big bowl of oats with Greek yogurt in it, uh, some nuts or seeds, fruit, berries on top, that kind of thing. Um, lunch will kind of generally be, I mean, if I'm training that often kind of ties me over and I don't want extra heavy, especially putting on a weight belt, like, you know, stuff comes back up. Right. So yep. if I'm training, I tend to train in the mid afternoon just to kind of refresh the brain. So I'll have a shake, uh, just blended shake in the blender, like protein powder, um, you know, milk, peanut butter, banana, that kind of thing, lighten the stomach. Um, if I'm not training, lunch will like always be like a big green salad, hummus, bread, this kind of thing, olive oil. Dinner is generally some form of like legume or like butternut squash, curry, make a lot of curries, cook a lot of Indian food actually because it goes, goes well. And I, I, I've reduced like meat consumption. Um, just purely factoring in the environmental side. So I've started tinkering around more with some like, you know, um, like meat substitute, like uh, corn mince and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I eat, I get my main protein sources would be like dairy, eggs. Um, and then I still do eat meat, but I don't, my kind of rule was not to like buy it into the home. Um, and, and that's not an ethical concern, but it is an environmental one. So I was just like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to have to do something. And that would be my, my thing. And there's obviously different, there's different low hanging fruit people can pick. You might um, be interested in, uh, Rob Wolf's new book. Uh, Rob Wolf wrote a book called sacred cow. And then he also did a documentary, uh, called sacred cow. And I think it's available on, I think you can buy it off of YouTube and maybe off of some other platforms, but really gives you a lot of great information on uh, regenerative agriculture um which you know in the documentary they, they explain how it doesn't leave behind a negative footprint so it might be something you're interested in because yeah, you might still I'll, be able I'll to eat a certain type of meat yeah well when i do so i eat more meat kind of in in these months because i love venison and there's basically no carbon footprint to right. venison so um i also eat a lot of fish uh, should have said that as well. Mm -hmm. So I'll have, I'll have oily fish a couple of times a week. Um, and I eat a lot of like, like, you know, snacky type fish. Like I eat a lot of kind of like buccarones or kind of anchovies, Ooh. um, that kind of thing. So, so that, yeah, eggs, eggs, fish, eggs, dairy are kind of my main protein sources. Now I do eat more venison during the winter months when it's, because it's only seasonally available. But when I do get meat, like if I'm cooking something up in the slow cooker, I do then try and opt for like locally sourced and, and all of that to try and factor those things in. But yeah, I, 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 I did watch a great TED talk a few years ago by a guy, the British maybe climatologist, and mm -hmm. he was talking about, um, yeah, regenerative agriculture and some of the research that they had done in, I think, Africa using essentially... Um, 
herds to to kind of mimic what once would have been a natural cycle of um you know eating a bunch of grass shitting on it moving on somewhere else and then watching that whole and it was it was pretty fascinating seeing areas that were essentially arid start to actually show signs of growth of foliage and stuff again and you were just like wow so what about for, to uh, some of your clients and people that you help? Uh, what is there a specific style of diet? Do you recommend certain foods to them, or is it mainly just talking about uh, timing of food? So I don't work with clients. Um, I I love the science side, but like coaching people one on one is a whole different ballgame. Mm-hmm, absolutely, <laughs> it's one that's it's one that's not for me. <laughs> um, I, 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 yeah, I just, I, I, I like the research side and there are people who are way better at coaching people and working on behavior change and all of that. So, um, but, but if I did as a hypothetical, uh, no, I, I think I'd be very tailored to the kind of individual, right? Cause everyone, you know, particularly people that are thinking about nutrition now, you know, they, there's different things they want to factor in. There's different ideas that they have and I'd be happy for someone to kind of take whatever course they want once they're not coming at it from a place of misinformation. I think that's my big worry is when I see people like I'm doing X diet because A and B and I'm like, I don't mind you doing X diet, but if your reasons are A and B, then, and that's really motivating you to do it. And those reasons are bullshit. Then that's not a good thing for that person to do. So as long as someone knows what the sus is with whatever dietary intervention or diet style they want to adopt, I'm happy once they kind of know what the, what the actual story is with it. Yeah. Um, I want to know about this because you know, it's when you were tracking food, I don't know how many years back it was, what was the reason that you started tracking? Um, because I found for myself too, it's like, uh, there was a, period of years that I tracked food and it was for competition reasons and body composition reasons. But after a point, um, when I started actually focusing on eating higher quality food, when I took out a lot of processed food that I was making fit into my diet, it just got very easy to manipulate my body without ever having to use a scale. And I haven't touched a scale in a very long time. So for sure. you, what, where did that start? Uh, and how did you, did your diet change to a point where you were like your, your food quality was better. So you didn't find it necessary or yeah. How was that for you? So I just liked being shredded. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I liked being lean, you know, a lot of the, and I, I kind of liked being lean all year round. I didn't like gaining a bunch of weight just, because, and, you know, even if I did want to kind of add a bit of muscle, you know, I would, I would tend to do that in a fairly kind of controlled way. So I, I just liked kind of maintaining that, uh, body composition. So I tracked and I, I did definitely kind of use flexible dieting principles, but, uh, I never kind of took the piss with that you know i wasn't like just seeing how much crap i can fit into my macros mm. i think i've always been focused on the health aspect as well you know so even when i tracked even when i got very lean like i never got on stage but i would get to you know kind of seven eight percent body fat pretty mm. comfortably i never tracked vegetables for example i never counted spinach you know people would be like oh some of my friends would be like oh but there's like four grams i don't give a fuck i'm eating <laughs> spinach right like i know so so you know there were some things that i just didn't include in that because i was just like i'd rather eat the vegetables <laughs> you know, i'm still gonna get there anyway and then yeah over time i just i started there were a couple of things that you realized one is that like you're you're i think tracking can really benefit in terms of like you start to understand foods right you understand portions um, I got to a point where like, I knew for the most part that I was going to need every day to get the amount of protein I wanted to get. And really the carbs and fat can fall where they may for me, for the most part, you know, there are some days I'm not training where my diet would look very, you know, low carb, high fat, right. Just, just out of food choice. And there are days when I'm, I'm training or there are some days when my diet might look literally like a, a kind of a lacto vegetarian diet. Right. So so how it looks macronutrient composition wise, once I realized that didn't really matter that much, then it started to evolve. And then I just kind of started to 
get a little sick of the monotony of tracking and I'd see something and I'd mm-hmm. be like, oh, I want to I make that for dinner. <laughs> and once I realized that actually I didn't need any of these tools to stay relatively lean or I didn't need it to eat to boost performance that I could, I kind of had that knowledge stowed away. Then I kind of got to a point where I was more interested in food being enjoyable mm-hmm. and delicious do you maybe uh, do you maybe still then, track it in your brain a little bit? Like if you you look at a recipe and it calls for butter and olive oil, you know it it, it requires a large amount of fat and a large amount of carbs. Do you sometimes just pick it apart a tiny bit, or you just kind of go for it and just load it up with fat? So so the only thing that my brain has this like funny little radar on that every time I'm about to eat, I'm thinking is protein. Right? I do. I have a little protein clock in my right. head that's just like. Particularly if it's a meal where I'm not going to have a lot of animal source proteins, then I'm then I'm, the cogs are going, and I'm just like, right, well, how am I how am I getting adequate protein here? You know, um, so it, it really just depends. But yeah, I, I have a protein cog. I don't have a carbs or fat cog at all. I I literally eat those as I as I prefer, um, and you know, but with protein, I'll, I'll definitely be like you know, yeah, how, how am I going to get adequate protein in this meal and try and get that in, you know, three to four decent boluses of protein across the day. And that's literally, that's a habit, I guess, at this point, as opposed to something I have to really think about too much. But yeah, I do think about it on a kind of meal to meal basis. Have you seen huge differences in people having, you know, uh, like a pre-workout type of meal, uh, an intra-workout type of meal or post-workout type of meal? Um, you know, people talk so much about the post-workout, uh, you know, protein shake or something like that. Do you think that have, have you come across, you know, information where you're like, you know what, this is kind of a must. Like, I think people should really look into, uh, doing this. I mean, I think, I think we, you know, particularly that aspect of, of nutrition used to be very much focused on these really tight windows, right? And it's like you have, and I think most of the muscle protein synthesis research now would kind of suggest, you know what, the window's a little longer than we thought, right? And, yeah, it might be several uh, hours, or, right? <clears throat> right, it's several hours. And, and, and again, there's, you know, are you protein fed going into the workout versus fasted mm-hmm. and all this kind of stuff. So like if someone trains first thing in the morning and they're, and they're fasted, you know, they might want to start that, that process and get adequate, you know, dose of protein more immediately. But if someone's eaten twice during the day and then they train mid afternoon, you know, there's, there's less of that impetus because they have circulating amino acids. So yeah, sure. They could eat two within two to three hours of that, of that. And, and that, those are the little things that like, as I kind of have been more in nutrition, it's interesting that, you know, where I was in my mid twenties, where everything had to be like spot on. And, and, and like, as you gain more knowledge, the benefit of that is that you actually just fucking relax. Like, mm-hmm. With most of this stuff, you just chill out. Like, um, and you get to a place where you're kind of suiting your personal preference. And, you know, if you have performance goals or this kind of thing, yeah, then you can tailor things to that. But I think most people do not need to micromanage their diet to be, uh, to, to really to achieve a lot of what we're talking about. You don't necessarily have to track to get to like, you know, 10% body fat. You probably have to start tracking if you wanted to go beyond that, right? You'd need precision. You don't necessarily need to track to put on muscle. You might want to think about it a bit more if you wanted to just avoid piling in a bunch of extra energy and, and, and maybe gaining a lot of fat with that. So it, it depends. And for most people, even recreational athletes, you know, the level of detail that they need is probably slightly less than they think, unless they have a kind of elite goal. You know, there's a very specific body composition or performance goal then things need to get a bit more granular. But for me, I just, I want to deadlift and squat and bench more. And I want to enjoy food. Like things become really simple. <laughs> like, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, if we could take like a step or two back, um, we didn't get too lost in the weeds and the way you explain things is very easy to digest. So I really appreciate that. We all definitely appreciate it. Uh, we talked about, you know, chronotypes. We talked about eating at night versus 
early in the day, fa uh, fasting, time restricted eating. If we could, and, and then you also mentioned like, well, people who listen to this podcast are probably beyond this or that. But if we can just think about the general population, um, because we're on the internet, uh, YouTube and stuff, literally everybody can listen to this. So thinking about people that have never once tuned into this show, what are like maybe the first three steps that somebody can take if they do want to take control of their body weight, they want to drop some LBs, what do you re where do you recommend that they actually start? I mean, I think one in in the theme of everything we've discussed today i think one simple thing is to look at how much of the day they spend in a fed state eating right um and the other thing within that that they can look at is the distribution of that energy intake right and it is a bulk of it in the evening do they do they tend for various reasons to maybe like under eat in the early part of the day because that tends to be something that kind of tees people up to over consume in the evening and what's interesting about the circadian rhythm in, in ghrelin the hunger hormone is that it actually peaks at a clock time of about seven or eight o'clock but people who eat more earlier in the day have a suppression of that rise in ghrelin so the reason that you know binging happens in the evening is not is not strange to me you you if you've under eaten during the day you get this peak in hunger naturally in the evening you know you're 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 going to be vulnerable to that whereas more energy in the day dampens that so i think people could very easily look at how long of the day they spend in a fed state and how they distribute most of that energy and they can benefit from, you know, compressing that eating window in a way that suits their, this is the nice thing about time restricted eating is it's pretty flexible. You know, you can compress that window in a way that really suits your preference, suits your workday, suits all of this kind of stuff. And then maybe think about within that window, how energy is distributed overall. And particularly for people that maybe don't want to start tracking calories and all of this kind of stuff, big meals earlier in the day are generally in some of the research, we've got a, a good way of kind of appetite regulation um, in an, in a natural sense. And when people have the bulk of their total daily energy intake or over 50% of it earlier in the day, you know, you often get these like smaller kind of meals consumed in the evening. So that could be another thing to think about. And then I think the, the final thing, if we're, if we're going for three, I think the final thing would be to, um, to, to try as best as possible to take sleep more seriously. And I, I think, I think that's something people go, well, that's not a diet tip. It's like, Oh, it is. <laughs> Trust me. You know, it's if also, you're a sleep, also a training tip, I would say. And a training it goes tip, right, yeah. goes like, right with all of it, yeah. Right. So if you're, you know, if you're sleep deprived, as we said earlier, and you, you, the the waft of donuts come, you know, it's it's <laughs> not, and it's, it impacts on so many areas. So, you know, I think all of this kind of ties into something where you know you're sleeping better or or longer. You know, you're not eating for in a, a sixteen hours across the day. You're not having the bulk of your energy intake come as discretionary snacks at 9 10 p.m and these kind of things that are very characteristic of the of the general typical kind of diet in in the us or the uk so they're really actionable simple low-hanging fruit that people can pick and their behavior is not we're not saying eat carbs don't eat carbs eat fat don't eat fat eat pro we're just giving a series of behaviors and i think that makes it a lot more accessible and just in case, so just we just so we don't leave anybody behind, can you give us a quick definition of energy? Energy, as in calories. Correct. Yes. As in <laughs> done. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I wasn't sure where you were going. Yeah, no, it's just because like I, I don't want somebody to stumble upon uh, this clip and then be like, he keeps talking about energy in certain times. I, I'm not sure what he what he means. Like, does oh, he mean right, like a yeah. does he mean like, like a physical a, energy? Yeah, like an energy, energy drink yeah. or something. But you of course mean calories. 
Sorry, yeah, that's 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 me being too researchy. Like, yeah, and so <laughs> that's what I mean. Like, let's you know take good, it back yeah. a couple of steps so that way we can you know not leave anybody behind. Yeah, good clarification. Yes, calorie intake. That's what I'm talking about. Got yeah. it. And yeah. also, more specifically, yeah. like when you're talking about energy calories, do you mean like carbohydrates and fat earlier, or like do you count protein into um, that as well? I mean, I I I I I, I would. Say say that there is a benefit to to thinking about protein earlier in the day because of its benefit on appetite regulation. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think that there is merit to a high protein meal first or second in the day. And, and even if people aren't particularly hungry in the morning, going back to what we were talking about earlier, you know, they don't want a, a meal that's like heavy in, in carbs and or, or fat and you know, there, there's, a, you can still easily have, you know, a, a pretty high protein meal with, without, you know, you could have like a big bowl of Greek yogurt, for example, and, and you're, you're getting a pretty high protein meal and, and you're, you're getting the benefit of satiety and stuff like that. But, you know, you're not having a, a big boatload of calories at that point. So I, I, I do think that there is merit to, there was a really interesting study from a group in Israel that does a lot of this research. And they looked specifically at high protein, high carb breakfasts where the calorie content of that meal was, was really high, right? It was like, set, it was the majority of their daily, it was a weight loss study. They weren't eating a lot of food. It was overweight women. They were eating, I think about 1400 calories a day and 700 of that was breakfast. And it was a high protein, high carb breakfast. And, and one of the big problems, as we know from weight loss research, is rebound weight gain, right? So people lose weight, they get to the end of a diet, they're hungry, they have cravings. <clears throat> this study measured ghrelin. And what was really interesting was the intervention itself, the weight loss was 12 weeks, but then they did monitoring for 16 weeks into the post-weight loss phase. The group that were having the high-protein, high-breakfast, high-protein, high high-carb, high-calorie breakfast were after 16 weeks of the maintenance phase still had suppressed ghrelin so their hunger hormone was still there was this like legacy effect of this of this approach and so there's there's there is some evidence to suggest that for from an appetite regulation perspective this kind of high protein high energy first meal and, and my hypothesis on this i know they used a high protein high carb breakfast i think my hypothesis would be you would get the same effect from a high protein, high fat breakfast because there's satiating mechanisms to fat as well as to, you know, high fiber kind of intake as well. So, but I think that that could be an effective approach for someone that wants to think about better appetite regulation, decrease their later evening energy intake because they're not hungry mm -hmm. and maybe do so in a way where they don't have to, you know, track calories or, or, or macronutrients even. They're just making food choices. Are you aware in uh, some of your research, have you kind of stumbled upon anything talking about, you know, eating protein and fat in combination together before having another meal? Because earlier you talked about, <clears throat> you know, if we eat at these certain times and we, uh, do some of these quote unquote like hacks um we might have an opportunity to eat a little bit more food and in some of the research uh one of my friends have done uh, joel green uh he talks about eating some protein and fat maybe about a half an hour before you have a meal and it allows you to eat a little bit more and it allows you to maybe not get the same uh surge of uh insulin that you might get from a, a large meal or a large car carbohydrate meal have you seen anything like that or heard of anything like that no, I mean, I've seen some of the preload studies, but most of them are focused on energy intake, right? Or calorie intake. So a lot of those studies where you give someone a, a preload 30 minutes before a meal, and then you present different diets, uh, different, you know, kind of macronutrient kind of combinations, and you see how much people eat, uh, you see what foods they select. You know, some of that is interesting, but there are a lot of factors other than the macronutrient composition that actually influence if you preload, you know, there's like the sensory properties of the meal. So using soups, for example, like because it's liquid tends to have this like effect on subsequent meals, but mm. it's not surprising to me that, you know, having some protein, for example, um, in terms of a better 
postprandial glucose and insulin response, that having some protein before a second meal helps with that. Um, fat doesn't result in an in, in insulin response, so it's probably not the, but we do know that, that protein doesn't. And what this is probably describing is a thing called the second meal phenomenon. Mm. Uh, and this does occur with, with carbohydrate as well. And basically the second meal phenomenon is, is, is most observed with an, a meal in the morning time. And what you tend to see after that is you tend to see a, a large insulin response and people would go, Ooh, that's not right. But that's actually a response that's um, because the circadian rhythm in the hormones that facilitate insulin secretion and, and reducing postprandial glucose are aligned to that part of the day. And what happens subsequent to that is in response to a second meal at lunchtime, the blood glucose response is much lower and the insulin response is much lower. Mm. And, and this has been shown to, this is one of the reasons why I think timing of food intake could be important in diabetes management because they've shown this kind of phenomenon occurs in, in people with type 2 diabetes. The difference is huge in terms of, in type 2 diabetics, for example, there was a study done in a group here. The glucose response after lunch when breakfast was consumed was 95% lower than Whoa. when the participants skipped breakfast and had their first meal at lunch. What the fuck? So, yeah, right. So seriously, that's so, crazy. I've never yeah, heard that before. It was. That's yeah, I'll show you. Some of the graphs are are so impressive because you just you you get this first meal, you get this big mm -hmm. insulin response after breakfast, and you get this glucose response. But the insulin response is comes down very quickly, so it's quite a sharp peak, and then it comes down. Mm -hmm. But it seems to have some sort of priming effect such that the next meal, the response is much less, uh, there's, there's much less of a spike. It does come up quite, the first phase insulin response is quite strong, but the actual blood glucose increase is much lower than it was after breakfast. And the overall, then if you pull that out over 24 hours, you've got this really beneficial profile of blood glucose that gets lower as the day goes on. And insulin gets lower as the day goes on. So, so is that the protein component of the meal or the carbo or, or just the fact that the meal happened at that time? Mm -hmm. We don't really know what the respective contributions are yet. So that's something to tease out in the future. But yeah, I think, you know, uh, what you were describing there could be beneficial for someone, you know, again, if they're not particularly hungry in the morning, but they know it's probably good to get something in. Maybe um, they just struggle they, with carbohydrates. Maybe they have a hard time, you know, maybe every sure, time when they eat carbs, sure. they have a poor response to it. Maybe by eating breakfast, maybe it would help cure that for some people. It, 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 it could do. I think, you know, I think, I think with the way that our current diet patterns are, it's, it's easy to look at carbohydrate in the diet and be like, this is, you know, potentially something that, is quite responsible for a lot of the kind of lifestyle conditions that we have. But the idea that chickpeas are equivocal to a can of Coke is just, like, it's just, we're not, we're not dealing with, 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 with like for like, and, and it's the same for, for dietary fat, right? You know, it's, it's, you know, the idea that the, the kind of, you know, fat composition uh, is independent of fat quality is just, is not the case. So I think, when it comes to this, like, sure, individual factors and tolerance and even just preference comes in to, to play, right? And if someone would rather scrambled eggs in the morning because they just prefer that and they, they feel more energized afterwards and a bowl of porridge, like I would have, maybe they're just like, that would put me to sleep or I'd feel great. Yeah, fine. This is, there's always room for these kind of like individual tinkering with diet and with food preference that we can, we can have. Um, but yeah, in terms of the distribution factor, I do think obviously for like managing diabetes, carbohydrate restriction to some degree can be effective, but it still doesn't address the underlying pathology. It doesn't, carbohydrate restriction in diabetes doesn't rejuvenate beta cell function. Um, in fact, the only evidence that we have that we can 
achieve that restoration of beta cell function is from these like 800 calorie a day liquid diets um, that, you know, are resulting in say 15 kilos of weight loss in six or eight weeks and massive reductions in liver fat and pancreas fat. And that, that allows it to kind of restart. So, you know, that, that's a very specific clinical nutrition intervention that someone would want medical and, and nutrition professional oversight with, but for general people, like, yes, there, there is the potential that considering the distribution of, of energy could be something that benefits their overall glycemic control over the course of the day. Um, and the magnitude of that benefit is greater in people with impaired glucose tolerance. I want to know, as far as the idea of metabolic flexibility is concerned, mm -hmm. right? Because like, like you were mentioning, you know, some people if it comes to eating a bowl of oatmeal, they're like, oh my God, I'd feel so sluggish afterwards. Um, but some people, they feel fine. And then some people prefer to maybe have eggs and some fat or whatever. Um, but can we kind of define what exactly metabolic flexibility is? And is that something that people want to be seeking out? Is that something that is necessary, you think? Or is it just like, you know, eat what you prefer within these guidelines so that you're healthy? I think there's, there's a, basically a little bit of both. I mean, for example, there was a study two years ago which looked at the order of preference in terms of, so it compared a uh, high carb, lower fat meal early in the day versus a uh, low carb, high fat in the afternoon and the opposite. And what was interesting was that the, the, the high fat in the afternoon, when it was preceded by, there was kind of a degree of metabolic inflexibility so actually like starting the day with really high fat content and then introducing the carbohydrate in the afternoon was, if I remember this correctly, that was the order that was associated with kind of like a bit of an impaired blood glucose response in the afternoon. Mm. Um, and, and I think there was the same with, 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 with the other direction. So I think the participants in that study uh, I can't remember the status of their metabolic health, but it was a study that did highlight that, well, actually, if you're, now, these were extreme, you know, high fat, low, like, so it was kind of looking at a, at a, at a, at a, at a, at an idea, you know, at a hypothesis. But I think for people who are, for people who are otherwise, you know, metabolically healthy, particularly for people who resistance train, I, I think a lot of that idea of metabolic flexibility is maybe overstated a little bit. Um, generally, people, if they're lean and you know resistance train and whatever, are going to have metabolic flexibility simply because they're metabolically flexible, right? Mm -hmm. There is some evidence from Kevin Hall's research that a ketogenic diet, if you're on it, when you reintroduce carbohydrates, you will have this kind of exaggerated or impaired glucose tolerance, but that's likely transient. And once you, if someone reintroduced carbo, like a lot of those test meals are just test meals after they've been on a ketogenic diet. So they're adapted to this unique physiological state and then they reintroduce carbohydrates kind of, like, well, it's not a surprise that there's a degree of impaired glucose tolerance that wouldn't be permanent. Mm. So, um, you know, but, but for people who are metabolically compromised, pre-diabetic and this kind of thing, then, you know, they're, they're not metabolically flexible. I, I do think that a more consistent kind of dietary approach in terms of like macronutrient content and macronutrient timing can be important for, for, for people that fall into that bracket, but for, for otherwise lean resistance training people, you know, they're metabolically flexible because of their metabolic state. Got it. Yeah, probably the truth of it is they should be burning something instead of, you know, continually introducing something and sure. what they're actually burning, it's probably almost irrelevant as long as they do that more often than they're consuming <laughs> energy. Right. Yeah. And, and that's, that, and that's where, you know, going back to that idea of how long people are, are eating over the course of the day, I, I think that's a major factor that we don't tend to give enough credence to because you're asking your body is constantly having 
you know, glucose and circulation, constantly having fat and circulation, constantly then you're talking about an exposure, elevated glucose levels, the effect of like continually elevated cholesterol and all this kind of stuff. It's just like there's never an opportunity for, you know, their metabolism to kind of fluctuate in response to meals across the day because, you know, they're constantly introducing more more calorie intake, you know, in between meals or even quite regularly between meals. So I think that's a major factor that we, we, we probably don't think about and because we're always focused on the calorie content. And then secondly, we tend to be quite focused on macronutrients and, you know, the different macronutrient compositions of diet, but actually the reality that it can take up to five to six hours to fully process a meal, depending on the calorie load and the nutrient composition, macronutrient composition, you know, that's a long time to be, to be processing food and that, that, that calorie intake, that energy has to go somewhere. So, you know, for people that aren't using it um, or providing a stimulus for it to be used, then over time, you know, it's, it's not a surprise that population health is where it's at in terms of these variables. For uh, in SEMA and I, we, uh, a lot of times we'll utilize some intermittent fasting and our eating window, I think is similar ish. We eat maybe two, maybe three times a day. And it's usually just later on in the evening. I think, uh, and SEMA does it cause he has like jujitsu and, and does some lifting, uh, during the day. I do it because just my major, uh, like kind of workload and lifting is, during the day. And then, so when I go home at like three or something like that, or four, that's when I'll have my first meal. And the last meal will usually be somewhere between like seven and eight. I've been kicking it uh, forward a little bit more recently to kind of see how that will uh, affect my sleep. Um, What are some of your thoughts on that? And is there any reason to shift any of this around or do you think that sounds good? I think for you, again, you're, you're training in the middle of the day and you're, you're introducing that stimulus um and you know it's the we talked about this study earlier the one that compared the four and six hour eating windows and those eating windows were were later in the day um than some of the earlier ones so yeah i mean i, I don't necessarily see a, a difficulty with with that um you know you describing that kind of eating pattern and and, and adding training into the mix is, is a lot different to us talking about someone in gen pop who mm-hmm. doesn't eat till three, but then spends from three till 10 <laughs> or 11, you know, eating right. a, a diet of very kind of high calorie intake and, and poor, poor nutritional quality. So they're completely different. So, you know, the, the, the additional considerations for someone who's active and, you know, isn't eating, but you're not eating particularly late. You're not eating early. Um, but your last meal is not particularly late. And, and personally, I, I, I think that that may be more of one of the reasons why some of these time-restricted eating studies have a benefit is it's not the duration of the eating window necessarily. It's the fact that they end up bringing their last meal forward a bit mm. from kind of later into the biological night. Yeah, that's something that I'm going to be doing more of. Because, yeah, I do my, personally have a tendency of, like, having, like, my bigger meal to closer to sleep, like an hour, an hour and a half before I go to bed. Um, and there, de- I definitely think that I could benefit from just changing that, yeah, shifting that two hours before, three yeah. hours before. It's kind of right. hard when you're not used to it. Because, like, I'm used to kind of stuffing myself, and then <clears throat> I go to bed, like, about an hour, about an hour later, just yeah. kind of, you know, preparing for bed or whatever. And they're, part of the reason for that is... You know, I used to be 330 pounds and coming down from uh, being so big. I just, I love food, you know, and so uh, intermittent fasting has really helped me a lot because I get to push all the food off until later in the evening and I still get to feel really full and stuff myself. And so the next move is like, well, if I stay up any longer, I'm just going to keep eating. So (laughs) I better better just, I better go lay down and and, and kind of forget Run to bed. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like chain myself to the bed or something, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, it, that's, I mean, I used to remember when I used to do the kind of um, more of the 16, eight, um, this is a few years ago and Martin Birkin's kind of lean gains. Mm-hmm. As, as you go. And so I remember at like that time, like my eating window would often be like, you know, three or two 
to like 10. Mm. I'd often have dinner at 10. Um, and that was often a, a pretty big meal. I was training in the evening. So that, but, but I did used to find that going to bed on a really full stomach and there is some, some research with this. It was like the actual depth of my sleep. Um, so my sleep quality was always a bit, you know, I'd find myself kind of like restless <laughs> in bed with this big full stomach, you know, or food Sweating. sweats. And I'd be like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not always easy and to then, have sex in that state either. <laughs> <laughs> no, right? Yeah. Stomach all yeah. sloshing yeah. around and stuff. Right. But that's, that's, that's the, that's the funny thing about like, about, about kind of like time of day preference, right. Is, is, is even like feeding into that, like kind of granular level. Like, cause I'm, I'm one of the, like, I do wake up earlier and I tend to go to bed earlier. Um, and my girlfriend's like a, a, a like wide awake at like 11 and I'm like, look, is this going to happen? You know, we're <laughs> it's, it's, it's eight, it's 8.30. <laughs> Come on. <man. laughs> uh. <laughs> awesome having you on the show today. I really appreciate uh, your time and, and uh, all the research that you've been doing. Um, it's really, this is really helpful to us and, and we're going to put a couple of these things into practice. Uh, where can people find out more about you? I know you have like online courses and all kinds of cool stuff going on. Where can people find out more stuff about you? Yeah. So that's kind of two main um, outlets online. One is with Sigma Nutrition, which people may have heard of, Danny Lennon. Mm -hmm. And we, we do a pretty regular podcast um, and we produce some kind of written educational content as well. And then I have my own website, which is Alinea Nutrition. And that's basically a, a kind of a research review focused. We do a weekly research review and we do some kind of like webinars and video lectures and stuff. And uh, that's, that's very much kind of aimed at nutrition professionals like dietitians or nutritionists or or people with enough of an interest to kind of um you know be 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 interested in the scientific side so they're my two main kind of online outlets and then my only social media profile is instagram it's at the nutritional underscore advocate See, I tend to stay away from Twitter because it's a lunatic asylum. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like nothing good happens there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome. Thanks again and uh, have a great rest of your day. Appreciate it. You too, lads. Awesome. Really See appreciate that. Thank Thanks. You. Man, so much goodness. Like this, this yeah. is a really good episode. A lot of, yeah. I love that. Super practical. Uh, you know, he's, uh, he's so uh, like simple and he's just, He's kicking us just real information. I mean, look, mm -hmm. if, if you, if you have a, if you have a time restricted window and let's just say you're able to get yourself to like eight hours even, you know, and within those eight hours you have three meals. Again, it's recommended by us uh, all the time. We're not huge fans of snacks. You know, I, I'd say like, you're not allowed, you ain't allowed any snacks. Right. And then I'd also say, uh, treat everything like a meal and ev and everything that you eat uh should have protein in it if it doesn't have protein in it then it's not a meal it's more like in the category of snack and we don't want you snacking because it's just it's too easy for that part of your diet to get out of control now if you could start to make better decisions and, and start to understand how your eating works and how you feel when you eat certain things yeah you could have a small thing of yogurt a piece of cheese an apple and maybe a protein shake or something that could be a smaller meal that would kind of be a snack right but for the most part we're talking about like highly processed foods and figuring out a way to stay away from those mm -hmm. when you do a ketogenic diet at least in the good old days before like there was a lot of keto snacks and and fat bombs and things like that <laughs> back in my day we didn't have any of those fat bombs <laughs> um ke ke a keto diet and intermittent fasting are ways of keeping things where there's a line and you don't cross the you don't cross over that line. And when it came to snacking, you just didn't have any options for keto, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess you could cook up like three strips of bacon, that'd be a snack, but you didn't have, you know, I think when we think snacks, we're thinking of like these things that are crunchy. I'm thinking of, I guess, you know, what what comes to mind is like a Pop Tart, Cheez Its, maybe potato chips, mm -hmm. something in a bag, something that's crunchy, mm -hmm. something that's highly processed that when you're done eating it you're like i'd love to have more of that you crush the whole bag mm. you're like i'd love to have more of that 
But when you get into this, some of this time restricted feeding stuff, um, it helps cut a lot of that stuff out through, you know, through intermittent fasting throughout the day. You're not going to have those same urges and you're just going to know like, hey, that's not on the plan. And I'd even go as far to say that I think that you could have some of those things after you've eaten a really nutritious meal. So if you still wanted like pretzels or a couple Doritos or something, if, if you can control yourself, mm. you could probably have a couple. You might be able to have like a couple Oreos, but if you're the person that eats a whole entire sleeve of Oreos, <laughs> you just need to know who you are and then be honest with yourself with that. You know, there's, there are some people that can eat, like I, I know a, a handful of people that they love chocolate and they just keep chocolate around. They have a, like a chocolate bar for like a month in their house. Which I don't know how that happens. Like they just take little pieces of it here and there. No way. They're a sociopath. That's why. yeah, yeah, yeah. They're they're called lunatics. These people. <laughs> but you can see how how uh, just adopting some of these principles can really assist you because they're getting rid of snacks. They're getting rid of sodas. They're just getting rid of just excess calories, and then it gives you a. It, this is your plan. I mean, this is. I think this is the simplest thing. Like, we're not asking you to make some crazy adjustment. We're not saying, hey, don't eat any carbs. We're not really saying any of that. I, I think that this is the ticket for a lot of people to get themselves out of fat land. Mm -hmm. I loved Andrew's question when Andrew asked, like, the top three things. I that hate Andrew because do. he doesn't talk. And then when he does, he kills us. <laughs> he has to fucking ask the, the best thing. And he fucking yeah, drops the silly. mic and the mic goes, Burr. <laughs> right <laughs> and that's that's all we needed because like he mentioned you know having that window having a bulk of your energy calories earlier in the day which in essence is leads to his third thing of guarding your sleep if you can if you can knock out these three things um you will make immediate progress then maybe the next steps are you know maybe taking out the process well you do want to take that process food out of your diet but maybe making sure you're not eating a crazy amount and all those meals doing that but if you're able to follow those three simple steps you will absolutely make great progress mm -hmm. and it's i simple. love that he talked about controlling hunger because mm -hmm. that's huge and he you know we we're talking a, a bunch about you know some time restricted eating but he talked about if, if you're new to a diet, we always tell you on the show every single time, take at least two weeks, maybe even a month, get used to the food that you're eating. Mm. Fuck fasting. Don't mess with any type <laughs> of fasting at all. Eat. Every time you're hungry, I want you to eat and fucking plow through food like, you, like you've never had before. Eat more, like for a little bit, because this is part of a long-term plan that we need that we need to have in place. And you heard what he said, what he referred to about people gaining weight back and then some, that's called the fat paradox. And the fat paradox says that when we shrink down fat cells really fast through means of uh, exercise and through means of not taking in a whole lot of nutrients, not taking in a whole lot of energy, calories, uh, that we shrink the fat cells down really fast and they have kind of rubber bands attached to them and those bastards as soon as you go back to having those bad habits They're just gonna go poof and they're gonna come back a little bit faster and they're they're They are ready. Mm -hmm. They are like ready to grow because the body's not Crazy. Designed for you to lose a lot of fat all the time you, you could burn fat certain times a year and stuff like that due to the weather and due to circumstances, you know, but for the most part, your body's not real pumped about mm. you having this plan to lose 50 pounds. Your body's like, yo, I don't think this is a good idea. Mm. And so you have to make sure that you're fed. You can't do this through just, you can't do this through trying to over-exercise. And you can't do this through a ton of under-eating. It has to be precision. That The name Precision Nutrition is an, an outstanding name by John Berardi. Because it does have to be precise. It does need some precision to it. You have to exercise. You have to eat properly. And in order for those things to function properly and for you to function optimally as a human being, you have to be able to sleep. So all three of those things, one of them doesn't have a higher importance than the other. They're all, they're all hugely important. If you just want to maybe look jacked and, and have some muscle on you and whatever, you might be able to get there by not sleeping a whole lot. And you might be able to get there by you know, training your training your face off and just being big and going after some calories, you might be able to get to some of that, but you're going to be so far away from what your body can actually really do. You don't have full access of everything that's actually within the human body. You have partial, which isn't great. Like who wants partial? Who wants, who wants to be represented with 60% of their best or 70% mm -hmm. of their best? We would like to be 90 or hundred if we can, if we can, uh, 
you know, be super strict about something, but that's what I would love to have. And so you got to take all three of these things very seriously. Yeah. Uh, quick question for, it's probably not going to be a quick question, but, um, or a quick answer. I mean, um, for both of you guys, uh, how do you, how would you advise somebody to consume all the information that they, that they heard today? Um, let's just say as an example, Andy Galpin, the last time he was here, he was talking about having a big meal before bed to help with sleep. You're right. But today we heard, you know, like, Hey, maybe that's not like a really good idea because of the, um, oh man, all the stuff he said today. <laughs> yeah. He's just yeah, restless and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, how, uh, eating at night can actually do something, something different than eating early. Um, so what do you recommend people do with everything we just heard you know how can they you know your stomach's talking trying mm -hmm. to get on the mic yeah uh yeah how, how should they you know take in this information um which you know obviously you don't want them to go run on top of you know uh, their soapbox and being like yeah. nobody should be eating at night and it. like you know like what what can people do to uh i guess responsibly utilize some of the information they heard today I would say that if we're talking about, you know, talking about something like weight loss and we're, and if we're specifically talking about, you know, what to do at night or how to have your time restricted feeding, you know, work best for you or, or any of it, really, we have to go back to like, what are you trying to do? And we need to take everything from there. And we have to go back to what Stan Efforting preaches all the time is compliance is a science. So how, how do we how do we allow you to stay on plan? If that means, you know, if you're if you're 300 pounds and, you, you know, I, I lay out some diet stuff for you, but I don't really mention like exactly what times to eat and so forth. Mm -hmm. And you eat at 10 p.m. and you go to bed at 10 or 1 p.m. Um, but you're making progress. We don't really have a problem. We have to go back to the basics every single time. And remember, Stan said uh, 7 percent weight loss. Uh fixed people that had fatty liver disease by only losing 7% of their body weight. And I think it's like so, something like 90% of all cause, all cause mortality, um, markings, uh, blood, blood markers of your health are fixed by losing 10% of your body weight. Hmm. So if someone's 300 pounds and they lose 30 pounds, they get to 270, which all of us would agree in this room. We've seen, we've seen hundreds upon hundreds of people accomplish that and it happens pretty fast mm -hmm. so losing 10 percent of your body weight can can increase your health in to some regard by like 90 percent i mean that's like that's 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 craziness and so if your goal is to lose weight and be a little healthier we just have to always keep that in mind and we have to say you know what that information is great but i'm just gonna fuck what i heard right there because it doesn't apply to me mm -hmm. because I, I'm, I would like to do that. I would like to uh, eat at seven and, and go to bed at 10, but it doesn't, I'm not focused on that right now. It's going to make everything that I'm trying to do too difficult. Mm. Remember what he said about eating breakfast as well and how it, it I wrote it down. because I was like, that's so simple, but he said uh, more energy intake during the day dampens. I love like that word. It dampens. Uh, binge eating mm -hmm. at night. Uh, how useful is that to someone who's overweight? What is the major problem with most? I would say, I, I mean, I don't even have any clue, but I would just say 90% of people that are uh, very overweight probably binge eat at night. Mm -hmm. They probably eat like, I mean, I don't even know, but probably like 2000 calories from some 6 p.m. to midnight or something like mm -hmm. that, you know, and it's probably throughout the day, they're probably not too crazy it's probably not too bad because there's a lot of other people around and people that are fat they don't want to eat in front of other people and so a lot of this stuff is is behind closed doors in the comfort of your own home and sometimes uh just in your own pantry <laughs> you're rifling through food i've done it many times myself so uh, i know what some of that's like but we need to control if you're trying to lose weight the main goal all the time is to shoot down hunger Hunger and cravings you need to beat the fuck out of those things as much as you can. So you need to figure out a way to get your body used to being full with good, solid nutrition. Once you have done that, you want to experiment with some fasting and you want to start to partner up and be buddies with hunger. And you want to start to recognize that hunger isn't really a problem. 
hunger is actually very healthy. It's actually great to be a little bit hungry. Being hungry for, you're going to be hungry anyway. Well, I tell people this all the time. When I was 3.30, I was hungry. I was still hungry multiple times a day. And it wasn't because I, it wasn't because of lack of food. <laughs> I was stuffing my fat face with food all day. <laughs> so with intermittent fasting or the time-restricted eating, you have an opportunity to be a little bit hungry throughout the day and something that's going to help you get towards your goals. Mm -hmm. And I mean, uh, by listening to this episode, all of you already know, but you know, when you're, if you're choosing to have most of that food earlier in the day, you've got to absolutely make sure that your food quality is high. Like this isn't like, this isn't super palatable processed foods that you're just going to ram through and not feel hungry. This needs to be quality food that's going to make you full. So absolutely make sure that's the deal. Now, as far as what you're asking, Andrew, you know, in terms of like eating close to sleep, Andy Gotham said that that could help you sleep. And, and he's then, uh, our guest was just meant, Alan was just mentioning how like, you know, a few hours before is better. Um, this is totally anecdotal, but the reason why I was laughing when he was mentioning, like when he used to fast and eat late, uh, and I was like, my, this always happens when I eat really close to bed, I wake up in a puddle consistently <laughs> when I eat farther away from bed. Like I did mm -hmm. last night, I think I ate about two and a half hours, three hours before I went to sleep. I wake up with the sheets dry. <laughs> like, like literally that, that's like, mm -hmm. that's what always happens. But sometimes I just can't avoid having to eat late. I'd rather not, but sometimes I can't avoid it because of everything that's gone on during the day. So personally, I know it's better for me if I, if I eat a few hours before bed, uh, but I think that's just something you have to experiment with, mm -hmm. you know, um, maybe, you know, have a few meals during the week, two, three hours before you go to sleep and see how you feel in the morning, see how your sheets are like, like yeah, pay attention to that. Um, and, and see how it is for yourself. What are you doing in your sheets, bro? <laughs> Dude, I'm having so many nocturnal emissions. You don't even realize it. It's just like, it's crazy. It's absolutely insane. What's nocturnal emissions? I, I was just gonna, I, didn't, I don't know what that Are means. you polluting the earth? Pause, y'all don't know what nocturnal emissions are? This is I'm a joke, by the way, for all the guests. Is that, that, a I'm wet? assuming it's a, a, a liquid. No, oh, just yeah. wet dreams? You're just busting nuts in your sleep. Yeah. Oh. yeah that's I figured what emissions your are. testosterone levels are still rising. You still haven't <laughs> even like matured fully. <laughs> not in your final form so that makes sense no, i'm playing guys i'm playing guys but i loved what he said about teenagers man he's that, not that, playing that <laughs> <laughs> that made me laugh so much it's just like it brought me back to high school and oh, sleep yeah. and all that that was great yeah you're just tired as fuck for all some the reason. time yeah God. you know i think if like um there's been a few people where i've given some recommendations to and i kind of almost forget that i've even ever talked to them but i remember there's one person in particular i said um they were like you know, they're like, I'm confused on what to do. And I don't know, you know, how I should do it. And I said, eat twice a day and get in, uh, you know, one gram per pound of body weight and protein. Mm -hmm. And I just left it at that. And the guy lost like 40 pounds and Shit. came back and he's like, I just, that's what I followed. I followed, yeah. I followed exactly that. And imagine if you threw in a, a, another rule or two in there, um, you know, and said, you know, get, get in two servings of vegetables or something like that as well. Well, now you're really screwed because you the two meals that you're going to eat, you have to have some vegetables with them. Mm -hmm. Or if you made a goal to have, I don't know, 20 grams of fiber or something like that, uh, that would be a pretty damn good serving of vegetables at yeah. both meals. Now you're responsible to split up over the course of two meals, uh, you know, or and or have a protein shake with a meal or something like that. You got to split up, you know, if you weigh 200 pounds, you got to split up 200 grams between two meals. You end up with a good amount of food. Mm -hmm. And then how hungry were you throughout the day? And then how satisfied were you? Like you get a huge benefit. You get a huge like dopamine rush from when you get home and you get to eat those hamburger patties or whatever <laughs> it is that you're into. Oh yeah. You're like, you're like really, really excited about food. I'd say m way more excited about food than if you just went out to lunch and grabbed a sandwich with a friend or something like that. Uh -huh. You're like, I mean... It, you're really, really, I mean, how much are you looking, look at the smile he's got on him. <laughs> you know, how much are you looking forward, right now, yeah, yeah, how much are you looking forward to driving home from jujitsu and just being like, I am going to crush mm. fucking food tonight. Yeah, it's. Like yeah. when you came over, you, you had, you just kept eating. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, when I went to your house, I was just plate after plate after plate. Yeah, we had like wings and burgers and we had all kinds of stuff going on. That's I awesome. couldn't deny everything that you guys were cooking. I was trying was to great. be a good guest. You know, I can't say no to what you give me. I can't be rude. Just, I can't was, be rude. It was fantastic. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's dope.
<laughs> I loved it. I loved a lot of the stuff that he uh, he shared with us today. So yeah. good show. Absolutely. Want yeah. to take us on out of here, Andrew? I will. Uh, hopefully, you guys appreciated this episode as much as we did. If you did. Please hit the like button. Go ahead and share it with somebody. Leave a comment down below what you guys appreciated the most. Uh, please make sure you're following the podcast at Mark Bell's Power Project on Instagram, at MB Power Project on Twitter. Um, also, we've been doing stuff on Clubhouse, so make sure you're following everybody here, but especially Mark Bell, because that's where we've been hosting the rooms. Um, but yeah, my Instagram, Clubhouse, and Twitter is at I am Andrew Z. And Seema, where are you at? Um, Instagram, Clubhouse, YouTube. It's at Nsima Inyang, that's my name. Uh, Twitter, and Nsima Inyang. And, and guys, if you guys are subscribed on iTunes, leave a review. It takes a few go. seconds. Yeah. Hit that five stars, because you know that's the only amount of stars you want to and you <laughs> should hit. And leave a review. We love you for it, Mark. You can manage your hunger through a you know a bunch of really simple things. One of them is, is through exercise. Uh, one of them is through eating. Another one is through intermittent fasting, which sounds odd, but when you get used to intermittent fasting, it really helps you gain control over your hunger. It, it teaches you that your hunger is not an emergency, uh, like, you, like you may have uh, thought it was. And then let's not forget about the massive impact of protein leveraging. So eating more protein, having protein be part of your uh, primary source of food, I think is essential for people that are really trying to lose weight. You know, keeping yourself full so you make better decisions throughout the day. You know, that's what I continue to get from this podcast when we have, uh, you know, it doesn't matter if we had Ken Berry on the show. It doesn't matter if it was Lane Norton. It doesn't matter if it was uh, Joel Green or Sean Baker. Um, it seems to kind of come back to this every single time that, um, you know, even even uh, even Lane Norton, he talks a lot about, um you know, calories in, calories out type of stuff and flexible dieting and, and things of that nature. But even when he's talking, he's like, hey, yeah, you need fiber and you need uh, you need protein, you know, and he, he says you need those things in reference to being able to manage your hunger. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's that's where the focus should be, because people are fucking hungry <laughs> and they make bad decisions when they're hungry. You got any extra tips to add to that? I guess I guess sleeping would would help manage the hunger as well. But absolutely, like that's that's why our guest talks so much about sleep because you know, you're doing all these things in your diet and if you're still not living a lifestyle that allows you to get quality sleep, you're just shooting yourself in the foot for the next day because now you all these cravings emerge that's going to fight against you and hunger. It's good, it's going to it's going to make it harder to resist urges. So, if you're doing all this in your diet, you're not taking care of your sleep. We harp on it all the time. You have to do that to be successful. And we talked about it, so Go fucking sleep. <laughs> and I think you want to try to figure out a way to manage stress. And we can't mm -hmm. manage everything that comes at us. But could you manage, you know, can you resist like overworking yourself, overtraining, or just never saying no to anything or never pushing something off to a different day so your day is better organized? I mean, these are all mm -hmm. things that we can do, but we just kind of push forward and like, ah, we, you know, I, <laughs> I got it. And those, those stresses, they impact us negatively in so many different ways that it's, it's hard to really even calculate. But things like that, uh, they'll throw off your sleep, they'll throw off your uh, preparation, uh, being prepared. So you have to, when we're talking about you're really trying to nail down that hunger and shoot the hunger down, um, let's not forget about meal prep as well. You know, having, having meals that are right there that are convenient for you to grab a hold of. Uh, we talked to a guy yesterday uh, who was cooking meals in an air fryer at a video game store that he owns mm -hmm. and he lost what 150 pounds yeah that's our boy uh, Matthew yep, yep yep that's him yeah that's that's insane that's that's amazing that's that's what we need I mean, more people mm -hmm. uh need to pay attention to those things because it actually makes losing weight pretty darn simple yeah I, I like that he said he's like yeah I didn't actually meal prep I just brought stuff to you know to work to just make food here mm -hmm. talk to your employer you know yeah or if you're your own employee then you don't got to talk to anybody you can just do it yourself but see what they'll allow to have at the office can you have a fridge there can you have a microwave there um you know and if and if the they don't want to have one there then maybe you say hey you know what i'll manage it i'll clean it you know what i mean like whatever you got to do uh to be able to get yourself head in the right direction Strength is never weakness. Weakness is never strength. Catch you guys later. Bye.